Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Budget and Performance Committee meeting. We will be discussing blue light emergency services technology this morning. But before we start, um, I'm sure we're all aware that today is the fifth anniversary of the devastating fire at Grenfell, which claimed the lives of 72 Londoners. Our thoughts today are with the survivors, the local community, and those who lost loved ones in that horrific tragedy. Can I ask members, guests, and all who are here today to pause for a moment's silent reflection and stand before we commence the meeting? Thank you. <clears throat> Can I now ask our clerk, Paul Goodchild, if any apologies have been received? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, apologies for absence from Assemblymember Assembly Desai and uh, Assemblymember Dr Sahota is here as a substitute. Thank you. Agenda item two is declarations of interest. Can I ask the committee note the recommendations set out at item two and ask if members have any other interests to declare? I see nothing else. Agenda item three, membership of the committee. Can we note the membership and chairing arrangements of the committee, which were agreed by the London Assembly at its annual meeting on 9th of May, 2022? Agreed. agreed. Item four, terms of reference. Can we note the committee's terms of reference as agreed by the London Assembly on the 9th of May, 2022? Agreed. Agenda item five, can we note the standing delegations of authority to me as chair of the committee as agreed by the London Assembly on the 9th of May 2022. No Agenda item six, which is the minutes, can we confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of March 2022 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. All agreed, thank you. Agenda item seven, which is summary list of actions. Can we note the completed ongoing and closed actions arising from the previous meetings of the committee? Agreed, thank you. That whisks us along to agenda item eight. That didn't take very long at all, did it? Uh, this is our main item of business um, around, the, uh, around the blue light services. Um, can I welcome our guests? We've got Barry Thurston in the middle there is the Chief Information Office from the London uh, Ambulance Service. Julian Martin is over here, Chief Information Officer of the London Fire Brigade, and that's an alteration to the um, briefing you were sent out at the end of last week. Uh, Darren Skates, Technology and Business Engagement Director for the Metropolitan Police Service at the end here. Stuart Crichton, uh, Chief Clinical Officer of the London Ambulance Service, and we have John Clark, Chief Digital and Technology Officer for the Metropolitan Police Service. Uh, thanks very much for attending today. Um, we're going to be looking at that, that Blue Lights technology, what's changed, and we've got this organised over four sort of different parts. Uh, we'll be looking at strategy, we'll be looking at the delivery, we'll be looking at outcomes, and then we'll be moving on to budget and uh, efficiency. So um, in this first section around strategy, I'm going to be starting off, and then I'll direct the question, as my colleagues will, separately to each... Uh, each service so we'll try and mix it up as well we won't do it in the same order every time just so you're on your toes you know how it works uh, so I'll start and I'll direct it uh, to the uh, the police first um, what what key issues uh, were you trying to address through the development of your strategy and uh, how did you reach the priorities that underpin it so if we start with the police uh, thank you if I can take that so um, just to run through some of the key challenges I think facing us um, firstly, was a, almost a double-edged sword in that we, we have more, more officers coming in, which obviously is very welcome, and it's very important that the technology department obviously reacts to that, and we're able to, to provide additional technology for our officers. Uh, mobility, so we're looking to uh, move to a point where our officers spend as much time as possible 
um, on the street or on, on, the, on their daily duties, so they're not having to come back to the station. So mobility was a, another key area. Uh, and probably the last one I'd mention um, is data. So we have an exponential growth in the amount of data, both that we produce, but also that we um, uh, gather in terms of evidence. So very important that we have a secure and effective way of storing that evidence, but also of searching it and interpreting it um, so that we can actually complete our investigations. So those are the ones that I'd, I'd identify. We went through an extensive consultation process when we put our um, strategy together, um, starting with our officers and the front line, uh, moving through um, sort of se senior managers and also stakeholders as well to then ultimately produce um, our digital strategy. Well, I'd, uh, in terms of the, the priorities in the Met, um, so safeguarding, so uh, keep, keeping Londoners safer is our sort of primary primary goal. Um, obviously, uh, recently, then it's been all around um, uh, increasing confidence. So uh, that's in terms of transparency, making sure we're at, we have an audit trail of everything that we do. Um, so when our officers access our systems, we're able to, to track exactly what's happened. Uh, and then also transparency, so ensuring that uh, the data that we, we generate um, is where appropriate, uh, disclosable and searchable. Thank you. We're just starting off. So if we turn to fire now, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, certainly the, the, the strategy I'm referring to is the published strategy, LFB in a digital world. Uh, just, just for information, we are in the process of about to publish a new strategy that's going through this governance cycle at the moment, but I'm referring to the one that's, that's published at the moment. Um, I think the strategy builds on previous, previous strategy in, 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 in an incremental way. Um, one of the things that um, we were focusing on when constructing the strategy was in common with many other blue light services, the majority of our interaction with the public is still done on a face-to-face -face basis, be that commercial, residential fires, RTAs, etc. So one of the things we wanted to focus on was increasing the digital capability available to staff in the organisation. Um, previously, we'd, we concentrated on what I call big-ticket items, mobilising uh, emergency response. But around the edges, um, the, the, the digital capability was lacking. So we de developed a series of personas, uh, which basically sort of the fire station persona, the sorry, fire station manager persona, people services manager persona. And it was a way of really um, identifying how digital capability had come alive and people could recognise it themselves within, within the strategy. And, and our three underlying um, guiding principles, I suppose, really, were to build on the resilience and security of the infrastructure, to recognise, as Darren has touched on, the importance of data to the organisation in driving everything we do, and obviously to, to, to try and prioritise our move to, to cloud-based services where possible. Um, specific challenges were no, probably no different to, to a, lot, a lot of other uh, um, blue light services, really. So we've got a lot of uh, line of business applications. Um, we're a 24-7 organisation with a lot of sites. Um, and a lot of support um, responsibilities, and obviously the financial challenges that, that uh, the whole sector has been subject to uh, over, over that time period. And then, if we go to the LAS, and then I'll have some questions uh, just sort of to cover that. Uh, thank you very much. So, so from uh, an LAS perspective, um, the the priority was really around um, transforming the uh, the current system that or current systems that uh, that we have. We're actually three years into a five-year strategy uh, around our, our digitization. Um, we had to revisit um, our strategy through, uh, through the COVID period um, to, uh, to, to, to adapt to, uh, to any learning from that. Um, but fundamentally, what we're trying to do is to, uh, is to build um, an infrastructure for the organization that gives a huge amount of flexibility for, uh, for, for the trust um, to actually determine its, uh, it, its strategy for the future. We recognize that, uh, that, that it's changing quite rapidly. We're getting more and more calls coming through uh, the system. Um, we're trying to, uh, to reduce uh, the number of patients that, uh, that, that we convey unnecessarily to our uh, hospital. So this is around making sure that, um, that we create the environment and the infrastructure for the organization uh, to be able to make choices in the future. Um, our priority really in, in this was, uh, was really the removal of, uh, of a number of legacy systems, such as our control systems, our telephone systems, the radio system is, uh, is likely to go, um, and also to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we are safe in terms of cyber access. Um, but it's also around uh, moving to a, a cloud-based approach. So it's uh, a cloud-first strategy that, uh, that we're operating. Many of our systems at the moment are not necessarily cloud-based, but they're certainly um, off-prem. So we move all of the, uh, the, the solutions now off our own premises for, for more security. 
And I think look, what's looking uh, or looking at what's going to happen with those, those premises is part of what we'll examine maybe later on this morning when we're looking at outcomes and things like that or budgets and efficiencies. But in terms of the, the strategy, I, I appreciate you're all different organisations with your own particular drivers, but there is, there is certainly some similarities in terms of priorities in terms of serving the public. The, the strategies were all launched you know, not that far apart from each other. So I just wonder, and this is an open question to whoever wants to jump in first, what collaboration was there between the services in developing these strategies? So, I mean, we, we, we have had a series of collaborations um, over a number of years where we work, work together. So um, we actually convened several sort of workshops and meetings um, to look at synergies where we could, could work together. Um, that particularly um, came out when we looked at things like how we design our solutions. So we, you know, we've, we've all looked at things like, for example, Office 365 and how we roll out that, that product set with Teams and, and video conferencing, et cetera. Um, what was actually quite valuable is we could share best practice between us as to uh, yeah, actually the approach we'd taken, how we'd approach securing our systems, et cetera. So I think that that's probably you know, an example of how we've, we've, we've collaborated together. Um, to actually understand where we could could particularly share designs and approaches, I think between between the parties. So Barry, yeah, yeah. So so we see we see it really at uh, LAS in, uh, in in three parts. Um, our our um, work with uh, Blue Light colleagues in uh, in London is uh, is is really really important. We have um, the Met Police link now, where where we we receive calls directly from uh, the system. We do exercise um, through Heart. Uh, our hazardous uh, access response teams do. Uh, exercise quite closely with, uh, with 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 other teams, so so all of that work does does go on. But also for the for the ambulance service, what is um, equally important is is that we're in a fairly unique position of uh, of being able to uh, to cover all of the uh, the health services in uh, in London. So we we see our um, ourselves as uh, as being the glue that, uh, that that holds these things together. Uh, and also to be able to move data um, through those uh, th those systems so that uh, that, that we, we have uh, a seamless transfer of, uh, of data moving from our side to uh, to, to, to the hospital side. 90% of, uh, of all of our access um, involves handing uh, over care to another healthcare provider. Um, so that's a really important part of what we do. The other aspect, of course, that's really important to us is uh, our, our national work where we're linked into uh, the other nine ambulance services. Um, and that, uh, that association is becoming much stronger as, uh, as time goes on, particularly given um, where we were through, uh, through COVID uh, and, uh, and issues with, with call answering. Um, so, so there are a number of uh, initiatives now that uh, are being put in place for ambulance services to support each other uh, much better through, uh, through, through the, the, those sorts of periods. That's an interesting point, because I guess I was being London-centric in my thinking about how do your three organisations work together, but were, were any national strategies developed alongside it, or did it, does it dovetail into any national strategies? So we, we um, uh, had quite a major part in developing the uh, police national um, IT strategy, our digital data and technology strategy for policing. Um, so the, the Met were a major contributor to that. And obviously the Met operates within a much wider policing ecosystem as, as well as the London ecosystem we've, we've talked about. I mean, some examples of where we've collaborated with, with other forces um, will be the single online home for policing. So the Met developed and co-hosts um, based an online service that now enables over 30 police forces to all um, take uh, crime reports, so non-urgent crime reports. So we've opened that as an uh, additional channel alongside our telephone channel to enable people to, to report crime online, um, currently across 30 police forces, but obviously our aspiration is to get to the whole of England and Wales um, and beyond. Um, we also collaborate over how we engage with the supply market, so over, for example, case management systems. There are two leading case management systems across policing that it's roughly a 50-50 split probably as to which forces use which ones, and we collaborate with each other about how we prioritise um, that those IT providers, sort of technology roadmaps, etc., right. to make sure that as policing we can get the best um, from the, from those suppliers. Okay. And so, in terms of fire, can you give us some examples of some um, collaborative strategies that were developed and are, and are being implemented, have been taken forward in your plan? Yes, sir. Um, so the National Fire Chiefs Council have recently uh, created a national uh, data and digital strategy, and the brigade has got some people from my teams to conduct to that to that um, to that team over. A, a major input into its development, so it's, it's still fairly, fairly early days for that, but that will be driving a, a sort of a national strategy going forward. 
Um, as Darren says, uh, over, the, over the past um, uh, five, six years, we've, we've met several times, and with Darren and his predecessor, when we were, uh, our, our strategies were being developed, we, we went to, I think it was New Scotland Yard at the time, um, we basically did a, did a pitch to each other, um, leveraged ideas, uh, shared best practice, um, trying to identify areas of cost avoidance as well, which is just a, it's, it's something that can be easily missed. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, other collaboration, historically we've done um, some collaboration with TfL on sharing data centers and networks. Um, we've done also some collaboration historically with the LAS on a procuring a uh, cloud-based uh, service management system. So there are pockets of it. Uh, there's nothing particularly mainstream at the moment uh, that I'm aware of that uh, is, is a new initiative. But um, certainly the, I, I would say that the, uh, the horizontal sharing of um, best practice uh, and, and, and information and insight uh, has certainly steered and helped some of our um, strategy development, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Julian, so I apologise, far too many concerts when I was younger. If you could just speak up a little bit, I'll pull the microphone in. It's, it's me, it's too much loud and bad music, I have to admit. Um, st staying with fire then, because Barry touched on the impact of COVID over these past couple of years, which is unavoidable um, to discuss that. And what impact did that have on your strategy development? Has, and has anything changed as a result? And if we go, if we go fire, police, LAS? Yeah, so um, COVID obviously has had a major impact on the organisation as, as a whole. Um, impact on the strategy, not so much. Um, one, of, one of the key facets of our strategy was the deployment of Microsoft 365 in, in common with, with many other people. I think the impact of the pan pan pandemic brought it forward um, and we had, we had to deploy it in a much, a much quicker way um, than we'd li like to, to, to be honest. I mean, we, our move out of our Union Street headquarters was, was very sudden uh, and suddenly we had people who... Um, wanted devices to connect, um, logistics issues, security issues, license issues. So I don't think it impacted the strategy in terms of deviated it too much, but it, it brought elements of it forward and made us do things um, quicker to respond to the needs of the organisation. I think actually it wasn't a bad thing um, because we, we know we've now moved to this environment where we've got a we've gone from a fairly centralised organisation with centrally controlled IT and fire stations to now this hybrid working environment where. Lots of people have lots of devices and can choose a the location they, they, they wish to work from. I mean, that causes its own sets of problems uh, at times, but um, I think now people are more um, in control of where they work and how they work. Uh, and so it's, it's added great to the, to the flexibility, to the work-life balance, etc. So in a strange way, that part of the pandemic has, has been a, a plus to, to, to many users. So, so what you're saying is the, the it's because we're coming on to delivery of the strategies in a minute, so the delivery sort of been brought forward, but the strategy for the fire brigade estate, the same really? The, the, the previous, the published yeah. strategy, yes. Yeah. The, the new strategy is, is slightly different, yes. Right. It's just things have been brought forward. Okay, for police, has anything changed in terms of your strategic approach? Yeah, I think, I think a few things we're learning. We're in a fortunate position as part of the strategy, we'd already started to uh, adopt new collaboration tools such as Teams. Uh, we'd also had issued out a very large number of tablets and laptops to uh, our officers uh, and, and additional laptops. So actually, in many ways, we're fortunate that that was the strategic plan. COVID comes in. By having that in place, actually, put us in a very strong place operationally. <laughs> Therefore, we're able to continue operations, let officers and staff collaborate effectively and securely, uh, do so remotely. Uh, therefore, didn't have to concentrate people into locations. Uh, and, and in many ways, it's, it, it has been a very beneficial thing. It demonstrated the power of the technology, but it, it did not inhibit any operational you know, efficiencies at all and allowed us to take witness statements remotely. So really, actually, it's been a great test of what technology can do for us. And certainly a key part of our strategy has been mobility and letting officers and staff doing it from where they are rather than coming to a, a, lo a fixed location. Uh, and as led us say uh, uh, in New Scotland Yard, also be very effective. Even today, we still have a lot of our meetings where we can be, you know, across the uh, the various boroughs doing our duties uh, without all physically needing to coalesce. So it's made us more resilient in terms of health and safety. Uh, it's allowed us to be more efficient in terms of collaborating. And it's also introduced, say, just new ways of working. So long term, it helps us with net zero aspirations around travel uh, and using uh, effective tools. And we see that again in officers coming through who actually like these tools and identify ways of using them further than they had been originally planned. So in many ways, it's been a, a great test, a sad situation, but a great test of the strategy and the ideas going forward. Okay. Thank you. Barry. 
Yeah, without repeating uh, much of what's been said, homeworking is, uh, is obviously one of the big learning uh, points from that, um, where, where corporate staff um, can, you know, sit anywhere and, and, and do, do their work uh, with all of the benefits that uh, that entails, plus some of the other aspects that uh, need to be considered, such as social interaction, um, you know, coming into work and just talking to people is, uh, is, is useful. So, so, you know, we, we, we do incorporate all of that uh, within our strategy. Um, but also, I think we've taken it a little bit further. It sort of brings part of uh, the strategy to life in that respect because what you're able to, uh, to do is to start looking at, um, at what else is possible, uh, such as uh, having uh, clinicians at, uh, at home um, working on systems. We, we think about corporate staff um, doing their corporate work, but, but actually you can have clinicians um, working remotely as well, um, which actually suits the, uh, the, the, the organization much better. It also suits their working time because you might only want them for three or four hours in the morning rather than for, to spend a, a day travel or time traveling into, uh, into work and, uh, and then time traveling back out. Um, so it does give you that, uh, that, that flexibility around it. Um, what it also uh, does is, is really importantly is, is that, uh, that it's pushed along the agenda to allow us to um, move data around the system a lot quicker now uh, than, uh, than we were. I mean, we went from um, having uh, just a handful of Teams meetings at the beginning of, uh, of COVID to by the end of March, I think we were on something like a, a 200 meetings a day on, uh, on Teams. So, so it had a huge impact in that respect. Uh, and, and also, sort of along with that, is, uh, is the need to, uh, to flow data around the system. But for our rem uh, remote cl uh, clinicians as well, for paramedics and technicians going out to, uh, to, to addresses, we're now uh, in a position to, uh, to, to give them direct access to, uh, to, to that data, which again is, uh, w was always part of the plan, but, uh, but certainly, as, as colleagues have, have said, it's brought all of that forward a lot well, it's quicker. That, it's that key point at the end, isn't it? So from what, what I'm hearing from all three organisations is that the, the strategy didn't really change, but it was actually the way it was delivered was brought forward. And so then very quickly before I hand over to my colleague, was there any, were there any challenges getting the, the hardware out, the equipment out to facilitate that? So, so, <laughs> sorry, I'll go, um, go, go, we'll go in the other direction. <laughs> It's uh, well, uh, loads of, uh, of issues, you know, from supply chain um, yeah. is uh, I'm never quite sure whether it's uh, whether it's Brexit causing it, COVID causing it, chip shortage uh, causing it. So, so lots of issues trying to get kit into uh, the organisation to continue the work that, uh, that we're doing. Um, but the logistics, I mean, we, we went from having something like 500 laptops uh, out in the field to, uh, to over 5,000. Um, uh, remote devices, so, so the logistics of, uh, of doing that. Um, we've just done a complete refresh of, uh, of all of the iPads. They're now three, four years old. Uh, we've just refreshed uh, all of those out to 5,000 staff, and we've done that. It's taken us about three months to do it, um, but the logistical challenges uh, of doing that shouldn't be underestimated. So is that, is that similar for all organizations? So, so I think in a very similar way. So we had to issue about 850 new laptops uh, effectively, but it did. It does put a strain on the logistics of getting equipment. And I think, as as Barry mentioned, um, the supply chains are were and are quite stretched. Uh, the vendors have encountered problems far down their own supply chain around provisioning, uh, and I think we all have that as kind of a, an a, a a heightened risk now than than previously. Um, so I think there are, there are still tensions in the system. But again, it does require us to be quite innovative where we, how we've sourced and how effectively we logistically got them into the right place. And presumably then it's IT support and capacity storage issues as well. There, there are the challenges. Okay. Yeah, but both the insourcing of equipment but also then in kind of then refreshment and refurbishment and kind of the proper kind of handling. So the handling of equipment is always a, a, a significant task. But that equipment growth would have been part of the strategy, wouldn't it? It was just about it being delivered early. It would. It, it, just, it just saw yeah. certain increases quicker. Could I, saw, Peter, Chairman, just add to the last point also what Barry made around, I think what it also did for us, though, like the use of video, it's helped us identify new solutions uh, for citizens that we're now exploring far more effectively. So this event actually has made us really more focused on how we could use technology to help the citizen experience better. And we're seeing that um, proved to be very beneficial uh, as we speak. I'm going to stop it there and hand over to my colleague Caroline. Caroline Russell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, so I think the first question just being, that I was going to do was just actually just being covered. But um, I just wanted to pick up on what you were just saying about new solutions for citizens, um, because I'm interested in how these digital strategies are actually improving the experience of Londoners engaging with your services. So I just wondered if you had anything um, you'd like to say further on that if we start with the Met. So I mentioned earlier the single online home for, for policing. So what we found uh, when we did uh, some market survey is actually the public wanted to interact with us digitally on occasion. Um, so particularly for, well, exclusively for non-emergency crime where they wanted to report crime at their convenience when, when they wanted to. Um, it also if they report online it gives them the ability to, to compose actually themselves and exactly what they want to say. Um, you know, in a, in a non-stressed environment, so when they're not on a telephone. Um, so uh, that, that was a significant um, um, sort of change that we saw. So we saw particular increases in demand in our digital channels um, during, during COVID and during lockdown. Um, we also actually developed additional um, services, particularly for the report of, of COVID breaches. So we were able to, to walk the public through almost some questions and answers so they could almost establish for themselves whether there would actually been an issue and then if appropriate, they could then report to their local police force. Um, so that then took significant pressure off of our call handlers um, and we could then actually properly triage and then investigate where appropriate um, sort of cases that came through that way. And probably the last thing I'd mentioned, so we talked a little bit about video enabled channels. So we were able to firstly um, have our officers appear at co in court as witnesses over video links um, more than we ever had before. So that was a big advantage. We also, on occasions, allowed um, defence solicitors to actually consult uh, with suspects that we had, um, you know, in our in our holding cells. Uh, we we take them to an interview room and then allow them to consult over video link, so that actually defence solicitors didn't have to travel into our police stations as often as they might otherwise had to. Obviously, during lockdown, where that was particularly difficult for them. So there's a few examples there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Although, presumably, for someone who is in need of a defence solicitor in a police cell. Um, having an experience over a video link rather than having uh, someone come into the cell to talk with them directly, uh, I, that that's so it wasn't potentially they're less able to be, you know, to provide the kind of support that, that the person requiring the defence solicitor needs. So, so, th so this was, was driven by the defence solicitors themselves as to what they felt was appropriate mm -hmm. for, their, for their client. And on occasions, if their client you know, wanted a, a quick consultation or it was a, you know, a, a, a lower grade offence or something they weren't particularly mm -hmm. stressed about, then it was something we facilitated. It wasn't something yeah. that we, we pushed. Sure. We allowed either. And our, our police stations remained open throughout for defence solicitors to come and consult directly if they felt it appropriate. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, so should we go to the fire um, next, just in terms of that experience of... The, I mean, I suppose for fire, because it's... It's all it's it's an emergency when someone contacts you, so perhaps there's less of a of an impact um, f in terms of the th that kind of more digital uh, communication. If I can just reflect back on, on some of the comments mm. I made earlier, uh, because of the, the, the nature of the services we offer, it predominantly we, we face to face contact is is still the main mainstay mm. of our operation. However, we have. Over the, the life of this strategy, we've, we've developed a new website. There's increased capability in there, so people can do more things online, but fire safety visits, etc. We've also deployed um, something called 999i, which is effectively a, a, an ability for a control room to send a text message to a member of the public's phone. So if you're walking down the street and you see a fire, you can take a picture of it and live stream it back to the control. Um, so that's, that's a particularly uh, advantageous bit of uh, technology. But as you say, predominantly, services do still tend to be face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. I think the next strategy that's coming out in support of our CRMP will be very, very different, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's, uh, I mean, because obviously uh, many Londoners now have a, a mobile phone that's got a huge amount of digital capability. It can live stream footage and uh, that kind of thing. But there are still a lot of Londoners who don't have access to a mobile phone or who have a very basic phone that's still that old fashioned, you know, um, kind of scrolling through, clicking things to be able to send a basic text message. Um, do you think there's a, there's a potential problem with some Londoners being left out? 
potentially, I have to say yes, then it, uh, obviously there is, you know, if, if people do, don't have a, a, a smartphone, should we call it, um, then the capability is, is somewhat limited to, to, to what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the 9 and 9 capability I I is good, but it does rely on a certain level of intelligence in, within the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and it is widely used, uh, we use it quite widely, at West Westminster Finance Service use it quite a lot. And I think others do as well. And there are alternative uh, solutions in the LAS. Uh, Good Sam, is it? I think something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's 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 um, it's quite well in, uh, embedded. Um, mm -hmm. But you're quite right. Um, if if the phone's not capable of a certain level of functionality, then potentially those people may may be at slight disadvantage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In general, what challenges do you think staff faced with regard to digital technological capabilities of your organisations? And were the key priorities that have been identified by your organisations the right ones? Um, that's in relation to the pandemic still. Shall we go for the ambulance service first? Yeah, I mean, just following on on the previous question in terms of the um, uh, our strategy that has enabled um, our direction of travel um, that gives our patients a, a much better experience. Um, and this was really accelerated at the start of the pandemic um, uh, in terms of, uh, as colleagues have said, um, uh, the pandemic accelerating uh, our ambitions. Uh, a, a, a couple of really good examples. Um, uh, we were using uh, GoodSAM as our video partner uh, and we're using uh, their platform to be able to look at a scene um, uh, through the 909 caller's phone uh, in the same uh, same technology and send a text message and open up a camera uh, to be able to make decisions on our response levels. So specifically, whether we're dispatching uh, our, our London Air Ambulance partners aircraft um, to a traumatic scene, um, but also uh, moving to our um, lower acuity patients, um, being able to have a video consultation Mm -hmm. um, uh, to be able to see, and I think a good example is a, a, a child with a rash and being able to see the rash, uh, enabling our clinicians to make um, sensible uh, and safe um, decisions. Um, I think digital poverty is a, is a, is a real problem, um, um, and, and we're, um, we're tackling that in the sense of not all our technology is reliant on the patient's technology. So. Uh, another example is if we attend a, uh, a patient who's had a stroke, um, we've now got a video pathway that, that enables our clinicians to link directly into a stroke consultant to have a consultation to make sure the patient's going to the uh, most effective uh, and, and sensible um, pathway, uh, which is having uh, a great effect on the, um, on the stroke care we, um, we give. Uh, following on, I think data um, is really important and the flow of data and we've worked really hard with the region um, uh, linking our strategy with the NHS regional strategy in terms of how um, we access patient data uh, and so working with uh, a collaboration called the London Care Record, uh, the One London programme um, uh, that the, the, the Mayor's um, been involved in in the, in the inception. Um, has really empowered our clinicians to have access to, um, to patients' clinical data, um, whether it be on the phone or whether it be face-to-face, -face, has really transformed the, um, the patient experience. Now, that's only enabled by our digital strategy in terms of mm -hmm. our staff having the right hardware, our infrastructure having the right um, capacity and technology to allow those um, data flows. Um, and we've seen a real acceleration in, um, in access to that data and uh, the clinical effect that has. And that all sounds amazing, but were there challenges in terms of the, the technological capacity and the rollout of technological capacity? Yeah, I mean, I think with, with any technology, there's always bumps in the road in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of how we get there. Um, uh, I think uh, to, start, uh, to start with the process, the, the governance processes... Uh, were probably more of a challenge than the technology uh, in terms of working with video. Um, and I think all of our organisations have probably felt that um, through the rapid acceleration of, um, uh, of uh, um, data and uh, technology in terms of um, uh, you know, how, we, how we govern the use of that video. And I think you suggested mm. before actually the appropriacy of a video, a video call versus in person. Uh, and we've, 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 um, we've faced similar challenges over the appropriacy of video. Uh, and we're still working our way through that in, in mm -hmm. terms of um, 
you, you know how we how we overcome some of those challenges i.e do we record a video consultation do we not record a video consultation there's an awful lot of learning but we've got to respect privacy there was a fantastic piece of work that the london care record program uh, undertook with the help of Mori uh, in terms of the voices of Londoners in terms of how they feel about their data being used that was um, uh, um, has really embedded what we're doing now um, mm -hmm. into practice and yes with that kind of video footage um, the kind of the the governance around what happens to any of that data that is saved yes. and how you look after it and protect Londoners from yes. that data being hacked or yes. exposed in some way um, uh, it could be very intimate without, information about without people. A doubt. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege to be able to undertake a, a video consultation and um, Londoners trust us with their data and that came out in the Mori um, uh, the Mori work uh, in that there's an expectation that we want access to data and two that we we absolutely look after it and so again our strategy is it's really important in terms of the um the data security that we have and the processes to get the foundations for using video correct and uh, that's really come about over the last um or the, the first couple of years of our strategy john you're nodding hugely did you want to add anything yeah i'm sorry i do that um, <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean i, th I think uh, a lot of very similar issues, but I think I also think in the in light of the challenge you presented, yeah, there are usually things like you know things like uh, security and cyber, for example. As we expanded out our estate to, to home working, that increased what we call the risk surface, and therefore accordingly we we made sure that all our cyber defences were <coughs> up to date and, and effective, uh, and and which is part of the strategy. But I think it almost just uh, tunes into even making sure it's doubly. You know, certain. Uh, we we share the same national communication networks. They are challenged occasionally with you know c capacity and, and bandwidth. I think you're right that actually, as we do, and certainly in policing, we collect a, a quite a significant amount now of more digital evidential data, and just coping with that whole storage and archiving is, is a, you know an ever growing opportunity and challenge for us. I think you just kind of test our operational uh, stretch more and more uh, in, a, in a good way, but it made sure that uh, perhaps the rigor we apply has to be more rigorous and security more rigorous and the content better, but also has helped us um, really focus on the, the experience for our staff. Uh, lots of systems to access, you know, are they unified enough? Are they kind of, are we sharing our own data internally? So as part of our bigger plan around more unified systems, it almost kind of gave us a good kind of uh, sense of direction, how we can still make it easier to use. Because at the end of the day, we try and make our systems very friendly, that don't require too much thinking. Uh, so that is a good continuation of design effort uh, in IT and technology. It sounds like a huge amount of risk, actually, just in terms of if you're storing a lot of evidence. Um, just, I mean, I know my own file system on my Surface Pro. I kind of try to be very organized, but actually it's very easy for something to get filed in the wrong place and uh, the, the safeguards for being able to find stuff. Yeah, we, we, I think we're, we're, we're quite good in that respect. We actually control that and manage that for our staff and officers. But I also think you're right, I think it's come across several times, certainly in the last few years for the Met and going forward, you know, data and the management of data, the ethical treatment of data is a, a great opportunity for us to do better in. Uh, but also looking forward to say, if you look at our growth rates, the amount of digital evidence you need to now maintain and keep for any case is quite significant. And that mm -hmm. is, is a, a very significant curve. Uh, so very important around data itself, data storage, but also I think in our adoption of open data standards. I think it's very important that we're able to share data across London, across all other you know, areas with our partners as well as part of the legal system um, and health system. So we're starting to ha you know, use this, the same data, the same r references without any duplication. So that is part of a longer ecosystem development for data. But I think the there has been, I think, a renewed interest in making sure we make best use of data, 
put, as you're right, putting in place all the safeguards to make sure it is safe and secure uh, and controlled. And I, and I think elements of this will come into the, the delivery of the cybersecurity outcomes as well. So we'll, we'll pick that up on the next section if that's okay. Thank you. Because that's where, that's where we're moving to now, which is that focus on, on performance and progress and delivery. And um, Assemblymember Pigeon is going to kick us off on this section. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask you what you see the key achievements have been to date since your digital strategy was published? Obviously, you've touched on a lot of this as you've been um, talking this morning, but um, perhaps let's start with the Met Police. So I think it's probably worth explaining this is our, our second digital strategy in recent years. So you know, we, we completed the first one and then this one was published in 2021. So if you forgive me to go back slightly beyond just the 2021. And that's the strategy that Craig Mackey used to lead on, is that uh, right? That, that was, that's, yes. that's correct, yes. So I think, I think if I look back at some of the significant things that, that we've done, firstly, when we think about mobilizing our workforce, um, so in terms of our solutions, so we've rolled out 28,000 body-worn video cameras um, and then subsequently refresh those. Uh, that significantly helps us with trust and confidence and with transparency in terms of um, what our officers are doing when they're on the streets. Uh, we've rolled out an extra 30,000 radios to our officers, so we've replaced the radio fleet, um, 20,000 laptops, 15,000 tablets. So absolutely looked at making sure our officers have the right mobile platforms um, in order to do their jobs. Uh, we've talked a bit about Office 365. We've also put technology in our cars, so 2,000 two of our vehicles that we've equipped with the latest technology. Um, the obvious ones around satellite navigation, but also tools that give our officers access mm -hmm to information um, sort of that, that we hold centrally. So when they are en route to an incident, they're able to gather as much information as they can um, around that. Um, we then looked at our, our digital services. So we talked about the single online home for policing. So it's, it's in excess of 40% of road traffic at incidents, for example, are reported online now. So these are not urgent mm. calls, but they're ones where, for various reasons, the public need to report that they've um, actually been involved in, a, in an accident, sometimes for insurance purposes, mm. and we find those are now, now reported electronically. Um, we've put in new tools to help us gather CCTV evidence. So we've talked a lot about evidence gathering. Uh, CCTV is a particular um, sort of challenge for us just because of the volume. So, for example, we put in a solution to enable every bus garage in London to provide any CCTV evidence electronically to us, moving away from DVDs and USB pens, which obviously inherently are not very secure, and also then bringing efficiencies for our officers, so we're not wasting officers' time going out and gathering electronic evidence. We've got uh, better ways of doing that, and then we've recently put in um, a solution for the public to actually upload evidence as well to us where, where appropriate. Um, firstly, on the single online home, but also our officers have tools now where they can send a, a link to a member of the public so that from their smartphone they can upload any evidence that they'd like to provide um, to, to us. And then finally, just to touch on, is, is with our intelligence and investigation space. So we've put in additional technology which has helped us, for example, with county lines where we're looking at the drugs lines going into and out of our major cities. So we've put in enhanced technology to help us analyse mobile phone calls and patterns of mobile phone calls so we can trace back county lines to their source. So that's been a particular success uh, with dealing with, with uh, drug crime and county lines. I could just pick up a couple of things before mm -hmm. I bring others in. In terms of statements, are you using technology to be able to sign off statements online with witnesses? Uh, we have, we've got a pilot in place at the moment um, using, the, there's a number of different, as you'll probably be aware of, electronic signature technologies mm -hmm. um, available, a number of proprietary solutions. Uh, we're trialling one at the moment. Um, it's, it's successful so far. Um, we find the public actually prefer it to some extent because they're not having to come in to physically mm. sign uh, paperwork, etc. So there is a pilot of that at the moment and then we'll be looking to expand that potentially when we get the results from mm, the pilot. British Transport Police certainly use a system. Are you liaising with them and other... Yes, we are. Yes, so we're working others. with... We, we're part of a National Police Technology Council, which I, I actually chair at the moment, just I'm on a two-year tenure, um, and that, that comprises of, of around 50 CIOs and CTOs from across uh, law enforcement in the UK. So that's where we can collaborate, collaborate. on that, that sort of thing. And just you're talking about an uh, achievement that is this huge um, device rollout, mm. laptop, so on. Mm -hmm. But in um, the recent HMI report looking at counter corruption, yeah. um, to quote them, they found poor digital device management hinders counter corruption capability. 
and it recommended the Met should establish and begin operation of an improved system of digital device management with accurate record keeping. Um, is that something you're now working on to address that particular recommendation to, to cement and improve this achievement you've talked about? Uh, yes, so we do um, have reasonable coverage of a number of our device types at the moment. So the, particularly the new devices that we've been issuing, so the tablets, the laptops that we've issued. We've recently issued 10,000 smartphones um, to our detectives and, and various senior officers, etc. Um, all of those are personal issue devices and we actually record exactly who is holding every device and then we audit that as well so we can ensure that, that they are. There are some other devices that we just need to understand how we manage them. So, for example, the devices that are attached to vehicles, because we can't tag them to an individual, mm. um, we, need a we need other ways of actually working out well, who, has, who has access in and when. We, we currently have to go to other systems to get that data. Um, and I think, if I may, part of the HMI report is actually, well, how do we bring that all together? Mm, mm. So at the moment, we can get a picture, but we need to look across lots of different systems for some of the, the edge cases, and it's how we can bring it all together to get a complete picture. Um, so I, and I think it's, it's about being more pro proactive, probably, in that space, to be fair. Lovely. Thank you. Um, LAS, um, do you want to tell us about some of your key achievements since the digital strategy was published? So, so our strategy was, was really around um, uh, strengthening uh, our, our existing uh, uh, infrastructure. It was about consolidation and then transformation. Um, although that they, they don't necessarily run in that serial way, uh, there are a number of parallel type activities depending on what the project is. Probably the most visible um, indication of, uh, of, of our strategy at the moment is, is three stops down the DLR. Uh, which is a, a brand new control that, uh, that, that opened um, just last week. Um, and, and they are now taking uh, calls and uh, um, dealing with patients directly at, uh, at our new uh, Newham Control Centre, which will eventually replace the, uh, the Bow uh, Control Centre. So it's a much uh, more modern uh, facility. Uh, it's probably the most advanced ambulance control uh, in the country. Um, I think I can safely say that. Um, but uh, that, that, as I said, that is one of the visible um, indications of, uh, of where we are. But there, there's been a lot of other activity as well. As an example, um, previously we, we would use um, patient report forms to, uh, to report or to, uh, uh, to record clinical uh, information. Um, we've issued all of our staff with, uh, with iPads. Uh, and uh, they now use uh, what's called an EPCR, an electronic mm. uh, patient care record, which uh, everything is now recorded on those devices. So we have uh, real-time information, not just coming through to us, but also going through to the hospitals where the patients are being conveyed to. Um, we've put in a, a new telephone system that, uh, that will allow... We've got four uh, control centres across, uh, across London. Uh, we've got two 111 centres, two 999 centres, three at the moment with, uh, with Bo and, uh, and Newham. Um, but it does mean that our staff can sit in any one of those controls, log into the telephone system, and they will get the calls that, uh, that their skills um, are, are, are mm -hmm. appropriate for. Uh, so 111 staff can move across to a 999 centre, log in, and start taking 111 calls, uh, which gives us a huge amount of flexibility to be able to expand and contract our mm -hmm. call-taking capacity. So lots of, uh, of examples of, uh, of, of, uh, of that nature, really. That's really interesting to hear. And Fire, do you want to talk about yours and also perhaps also move on to with you what are the key challenges since your strategy was published and how you're addressing them? Certainly. Um, so one of the things that, uh, one of the key key um, deployments uh, deliverables from our strategy we so far has been the fire survival guidance application. So this was a direct Grenfell Tower recommendation. Um, it, it, it's in it intended to actually improve situational, situational awareness between the control room and the bridgehead. Um, it's, it's, it went live earlier this year. Uh, it's been uh, extremely well received. Um, it was quite a complex thing to develop, and it's actually sector first, so uh, no other fire service has done it. Um, so we're, we're incredibly proud of that, and uh, it, hopefully it'll work very well go going forward. Um, similarly to um, some other comments that have been made, so we've completely refreshed our mobile data terminal estate on all our fire appliances um, with, with, with new, uh, new ruggedized tablets. We've put 4G tablets into the rear of every fire appliance and change the sat-nav um, equipment so that it now receives a mobilising system, a message directly from the mobilising system and plots a route to the incident, taking into account the dimensions of the vehicle. So that was quite a logistical challenge to, to, to do whilst maintaining operational service. Um, and also um, the rollout of the LFB data portal. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the importance of data. So the, the 
the deployment of this data portal really enables a single pane of glass to be um, viewing on data of the organization, self-service reports, and we aim to build on this going forward with the next strategy with the development of the business intelligence competency unit, so pushing that um, self-service and an ability to manipulate and be better data users out to, out to the rest of the organization. A um, number of other things that uh, have happened during the life of the strategy, we've completed update to the home fire safety visit system. Um, we've supported the move for operational staff to move from role to rank, uh, which is a very fire-specific uh, thing. Um, implementation of FRS national operational guidance, uh, 99I, I think we spoke of, uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, back office included a move away from Windows phones to Android, Android mobile phones um, some time ago. Um, launched data portable, we mentioned uh, a new Windows 10 desktop. Um, and um, completed work to improve personal information retention to be more GTB, GDPR compliant. And it, it goes on, mm -hmm. there's a number of, mm -hmm. I, won't, I won't read them all out. To come to the second point of your question about yeah, the, the challenges, yes. I think I picked up particularly on, on a comment that my colleagues made earlier about security. Mm. Um, this is a, an increasing challenge for us. Um, you know, the, the pandemic, as I said, brought forward some plans that we had to, to enable more flexible hybrid working, but it does come with its own set of challenges. We are in the process of trying to um, work towards cyber essentials compliance. Um, it's more challenging than we thought it may be. Um, the scope keeps changing. And the, the, um, you mentioned earlier about management of digital devices. It's, it's quite a challenge to actually get a handle on all these things which you need to do for this. So I would say security is probably up there in terms of one of the major challenges for us. Obviously, the events you know, happening in Eastern Europe at the moment um, focus the mind somewhat. We are constantly reminded that there's a risk of collateral damage from such events. So um, it's never out of the spotlight, uh, and it never goes away. And uh, it's just uh, it's finding that balance between usability and, and security, because one of the great benefits of tools such as 365 is that it enables people to work in a different way. Uh, and the counterbalance to that is that it, you need to do it in a secure way, and that's constantly attention as well. I, I would say that that's the main one. I also recognize the challenges around video, management of video, GDPR compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some common themes there. Um, I would say that those are probably the two main main challenges for us. And can I just, before I come back to, to our, our, other, our other blue light services about um, about challenges, what about legacy um, infrastructure? Is that still a challenge? What sort of percentage have you got that's legacy? As percentage, it were? I couldn't give you right now. I'd have to come back to you on that. Mm -hmm. But um, we are rapidly trying to uh, move away from, from legacy yeah. infrastructure. We, we obviously can't move <coughs> away from a, an infrastructure if a business application is still running on it unless, until the business has replaced that application. And case in point being finance systems, HR systems, which are now all moving from on-premise to cloud-based solutions, hopefully. So mm -hmm. over time, that um, legacy infrastructure will erode. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the calendar year, predominantly most of it will have gone. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say all of it will have gone. It d depends on certain projects in training, whether they're developed, um, de delayed or not. But it's, it's a challenge because obviously once uh, infrastructure's uh, legacy out of support, it's more difficult to receive updates for it. Mm -hmm. So you have to, t you have to take um, countermeasures, um, do, do different things, design things differently. Um, so I think ideally we have no legacy infrastructure. Um, we do have some. We realize we need to remove it soon as, and we have plans to do so. And can I just put, there's one um, legacy system that actually affects all of you and will be having an impact on all of you, and that's your shared radio system because the um, emergency services network, which is being led by home office, is seriously delayed. I think it's 2024 is the current estimate. No, I'm getting a shake of a head. 28 is the latest estimate. 2028? It was 26. They've recently said it's 2028. Well, I mean, this, this is unbelievable, really. Um, but, you know, that, that, that came out of 7-7, seven, seven, didn't it, and, and all that. So, actually, um, this is quite extraordinary. What financial impact is that having on you, and also in terms of having to stretch out um, your existing service, a legacy network, as it were? I'm, I'm not sure that the um, delay to ESN is having a financial impact on us at the moment. Um, we do, I, I believe I might say, and still receive a government grant for, for yes, part of the cost. Yes, I think you've got a programme that's funded by the Home Office. Yeah. I don't know about um, the others. Yeah. We are in the process of um, upgrading various equipment at the moment in our control room uh, to, to make sure things can continue to, to work uh, effectively. Uh, and we are assured that Airwave will be there for, for some time. Um, there was a, at one point there was a rumour of a 2026 cutoff, but I think yes. that's been um, put on ice now. Okay. Um, we were concerned, of course, because we are replacing our mobilising system shortly. And we were concerned, concerned about the two projects clashing. 
obviously we don't need to be as concerned now because the national one has moved back. So there's a, a slight positive from the negative of the yeah. delay in that, really. But um, I'm not I'm not aware of any financial consequences so of the delay. It's not impacting your capability because it, you're using something that Airwave, which must be quite a clunky system compared to newer modern technology. Well, Airways are very low bandwidth um, bearer. It's secure. Um, so if we were, which, which we are going forward, looking at basing um, more capability based around ESN and, and you know, real broadband, secure broadband, then obviously those plans may have to be deferred somewhat or may have to find other ways of doing it. Mm. Um, but so I suppose in that respect, yeah, it, it, will, it will not allow us to harness the capability of ESN yes. Uh, yes. as quickly as we might have wanted to, yeah. If I come to, oh, police are waving. Let's go to police first and then I'll come to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Y yes, yeah, just on the airway, so I think you're right operationally, uh, you know, we don't see that as a, as a immediate problem. I think the, there's there's clear confidence from Home Office about extending to 28 from a, a technology perspective. Um, however, at the same time, on the airwave side of things, they are currently going through a CMA review with Motorola, the provider that reports, I think, in June and then concludes hopefully in September. Um, that possibly might result in a change in the funding model for airwave, and you might, we might therefore get some slight change reduction in the cost of airwave mm -hmm. uh, rather than ESM. So the, I think we're, we're waiting on the outcome of the CMA review, uh, which is due to report initially uh, any day soon. Okay, what, what are, this is obviously causing some challenge to you. Is it having an impact? And what other challenges are there um, since your digital strategy was published? Well, so I don't think that is a challenge. The airwave is a challenge to state. That's a, an opportunity that there will be some change right. in the funding uh, from us in that respect. Again, we also, you know, keep a key part of our strategy is working with the national programs. Uh, it's a, a major part of our, our investment. Uh, no, it's just an ongoing, uh, you know, the, the synchronization of those <coughs> deliverables. Uh, they're like all large programs, they, they, they do face some challenges. Uh, we are quite proactive in working with the Home Office to try and help to get to a better solution. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we are a big user of ANPR. This is mm. number of recognition. Um, you know, they are they're, they're trying to deliver some new additions to that. Uh, some challenges, but we're working with them to see what can be done to resolve that. So, yeah, I think it's just the ongoing engagement with mm -hmm. the Home Office, but that does, you know, present a, a quite a healthy part of our budget. What about some of the other key challenges? Is there anything else you want to add since your digital strategy was published and about any legacy infrastructure you're still dealing with? I think, well, I think for the MEP, for MPS, we, you know, we do have legacy still. <laughs> uh, we, but as part of Good House, we were always trying to clean the house all the time. And, and we many ways trying to do that by uh, investing money to save money and doing that quite effectively. Uh, a lot of our future programs currently, they will rationalize a lot of our systems. Mm. They take what were eight into one, uh, and therefore we get rid of the eight and the cost that goes with them. But also the fact that legacy management, how that gets gets easier. But also as we go through across the rest of our estate, we're always looking for any duplication or rationalization plans. We have a rationalization plan where we're always trying to reduce any unnecessary uh, elements that we no longer need. We aim mm. towards a more of a a platform strategy, uh, big platforms that go across the whole MPS rather than lots of individual, say, mm -hmm. products, and that's an ongoing activity. Uh, but I think that's also just part of good you know, technology management, housekeeping, and mm. to date, the last few years, we've been quite good at doing that, and that's, been, that's actually generated more savings than cost, and that's always a nice mm. outcome. Well, this talking of housekeeping, Assembly Member Pigeon, I'm keen to bring some other people in. If you want to, yeah, I was just going to LAS questions. next, yeah, and then right. I'd finish. Yeah, I'd be interested to see that rationalisation strategy if we can, and and what you've delivered, so we can actually try to measure that. And just LAS, if there's anything you've got to add on the challenge and legacy infrastructure. So, so from from a, an airwave perspective, um, mm. there, there, there are uh, we, we're we're, uh, we're we're sort of fun funded through uh, the the ambulance radio program that uh, that oversees all of uh, the ambulance services in uh, in the UK. Um, we're about to uh, to change our control room um, equipment, so as as part of this uh, this process. So we're still on um, the uh, the existing airwave network. But we do move away from uh, the existing uh, integrated control system to mm -hmm. a, a new um, control system. Our, our um, issues probably are more around um, current restrictions. You know, as we get busier, um, we, we have more vehicles on the road. We, we would like more channels, more, uh, more dispatchers, 
um, that, uh, that are able to, uh, to do that, whereas the, the existing system maybe has limitations in, uh, in that respect. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. around capacity. Um, legacy is, uh, is, has been a big issue in, in uh, LAS. Uh, legacy infrastructure, legacy application uh, has been a significant mm -hmm. issue for us for, for a long time. We're actually on phase four um, of our infrastructure modernization now, so this is the final phase. Um, that, uh, that we'll see all of the, uh, the last of um, the, the infrastructure um, out through the door, plus, um, plus most of the, uh, the existing applications. So uh, the telephone system gets, uh, has, has just been upgraded and replaced. Um, we, we, as I say, we put a new control room system in over the next, uh, the next couple of months. Uh, but we also replace our, our, mm -hmm. our CAD system, the computer-aided dispatch system, mm -hmm. uh, gets replaced in, uh, in, in September. Uh, which then does away with a lot of um, other legacy hardware that, uh, that, that we do have in the organization, such as Windows 7 um, terminals in, uh, in the mm -hmm. control rooms. Um, so, so we are making good progress, but we would expect most of that to, uh, to be gone by the end of the current financial year. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Chair. You. Thanks very much. Uh, Assemblymember Russell, did you want to come here? So stick yes, to very, you. very briefly, just picking up specifically on legacy infrastructure with the Met. Um, just before the pandemic in December 2019, I was told in response to a mayor's question that there were still 340 XP computers in the Met, the majority of which were standalone and so didn't connect to the Met systems, but were cited on Met premises for access to legacy systems. Um, and the objective was to have removed all of those by the end of 2020. And I just wondered if that actually happened or whether those, uh, or whether the pandemic interrupted that removal. Uh, it, it did happen. So we're now almost entirely Windows 10. Uh, there's no XP. There are a very small number of Windows 8 devices that we have for some particular reasons, but they're in extended support with Microsoft. So Great. we Th don't have any XP. Th thank you very much. And the only other question for you is, are there any software programs or items of hardware currently in use by the Met that are beyond the manufacturer's end of service life date? I, I think almost invariably that there will be. Um, what we do where we find, so sometimes it's necessary to maintain software beyond the manufacturer's recommended uh, time frame. What we do in those situations is we then put additional measures around that software to then prevent any vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so y yes, there will be. I don't have a list, um, but but yes, You've got and, mitigation. and we then put mitigations in place because we need to then enhance the wrapper around those to prevent any vulnerability. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Assembly Member Hall, please. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I'll start with um, Fire Brigade, if I may. How do you report progress on your strategy internally and externally, and do you have any KPIs? that you use to report progress on these strategies? Yes, thank you. Um, the strategy itself um, is reviewed internally by my management team on a quarterly basis. So we, we look at the, 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 wor the work plan more that, that's associated with the strategy. So the strategy is a, is a plan and a sense of direction. So the work plan are a key set of deliverables that are associated with it. So we review those on a quarterly basis, make changes and adjustments as necessary. On an annual basis, we report progress on the work plan to the corporate board. Uh, we also take the strategy, strategy to the corporate board for an annual refresh. So it's a living document, times change, challenges alter. So we refresh it, it's pretty much a light touch refresh normally. We take that through the corporate board for, um, for assessment. Um, periodically we have internal audit reviews. Um, I'm not sure we report externally. Uh, I, I'm not aware we, we report anywhere externally on the, on the strategy unless the corporate board subsequently goes on to City Hall. I, I don't know. Okay. And what are your key risks to the strategy at the moment? The key risks to the strategy at the moment, um, I suppose really um, over the life of the strategy that's just, just, uh, just happened, we're, we're really um, resourcing, um, recruitment's a problem sometimes, skills, making sure we've got skilled people to deliver what we said we're going to deliver, when we're going to deliver it. Um, obviously, you know, we have to compete with private sector organisations in central London, it's a challenge, not just for us, for my colleagues as well, I imagine. So I think, I think um, recruitment certainly, certainly is a challenge. Um, obviously, the, the, the budgetary environment we, we live in, you know, and we, we, when we set out to um, define parts of the strategy, we have to be aware of the economic um, environment we live in. We have to contribute to corporate savings, as every other department does. So uh, we have to moderate some of our investment uh, ambition in, in that respect. 
Um, but I would say security, recruitment, and, and, and finance probably the key key challenges. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any um, anything that you can share with this committee around KPIs, around delivery, and anything that you can share with us? Um, in terms of the strategy, not, not so much. I mean, I've got a, a, a very detailed work plan, which I've already shared in advance with the committee clerks, um, that says what we said we're going to do, whether it happened or not, whether it was late, etc. And it's quite detailed. Um, I don't have KPIs as such, no. no. Okay. Can I also say a question to the Met, please? Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I think we have, we have a number of areas where we measure the strategy uh, from our... Um, a number of boards and governance structures where we meet weekly, every other week, monthly, where we look at projects and programs and investments. I mean, starting start from the starting point where we make an investment case through a PIB and IM process, where the business case put forward usually has with it the right KPIs we're going to use and how we measure those KPIs uh, and the kind of the quantification or crystallization of the benefits. So that's an ongoing process we use through a series of governance structures. In the performance board uh, run by the management board itself, uh, we, we have a number of pillars we look at. One of them is digital and data, and is that in that it has a whole range of KPIs, which over time they evolve and change where we look at certain areas. So that's a very, very you know, um, proper process, and that meets on, a, on about a quarterly basis um, to go through those. What is key in that process, by the way, with the KPIs is uh, not just look at the, the number, where there's a, a numerical KPI, but it leads to the question of, right, why is it seven rather than eight, or what, what is it that we're, we're not doing that could make it better? It's almost the narrative. It helps us understand, you know, is technology failing? Is it a training issue? Is it a, a user issue? So, you know, we measure the use of body-worn cameras, for example, which are highly you know, utilized across, across the force. But where we see blips in its usage, it helps go, well, why is, why is there a drop in that area during that period of time? So it helps us really challenge us about the you know, utilization of technology. So we do have that, that range of performance, and I think they, and the performance board is shared with MOPAC. We have that all kind of uh, openly shared as part of an ongoing process. Your second question around the challenges, I think similar. Um, Cyber, because I'm not saying it's number one, but it's always there. We have to be very you know, alert to cyber uh, in, in these strange times, especially as a blue light service. Uh, people, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a market where the demand for digital skills has never been great. In my, my own entire career, I've never seen it uh, uh, so d in much demand. Uh, cause I think people realise during COVID how important technology can be, can be a great enabler. As a result, therefore, there is a lot of uh, demand for great people. Um, so, and so, therefore, we are doing everything from trying to retain staff, but also I think we've got more to do around becoming a more of an anchor institution or being a place where we can teach people how to use technology and stay with us and, and explore its use. Uh, overall capacity, we have a lot of work going on, so how we manage that, the bandwidth of change. You know, you've got to be careful how you, how much change you can bring to an organization at one time. Uh, and just that balance, if you look at our strategy going forward, we do have to balance between making life better for citizens, with la making life better for the officers also. But we also need to keep the lights on, do the basics, and build some of the infrastructure. So we're always having that, um, that that equation of balancing those four areas is a, is a, a continual reflection that we do. So is recruitment a real problem for you at the moment? Re recruitment is a problem. Yeah, uh, we we I think like I think all we all struggle with recruitment, uh, finding talent, getting the talent, competing. Um, you know, the capital is a very popular place for people with digital skills. Vetting, you know, we, we you know going through the vetting process. Um, yeah, it's a very competitive marketplace. Um, I know vetting in some of your um, different departments in, in, in the police is a, a real problem. How long does it take to vet somebody without the IT skills that you need? Uh, it does vary. 
Um, I, I mean, pro probably around six weeks would be rough. I would guess is the average, but some, sometimes it could be more, sometimes it could be less. It depends on the vetting process and the complexity, depending on you know, where the individuals lived and worked, the family connections, etc., as to how much vetting is required for the according to the, the risk assessment. So I, I can't give an exact figure, I'm afraid, but I, I would. Okay. It, it, the average would be probably around six weeks. Okay, fine. That, that's nowhere near as bad as in some departments we've, okay. we've, we've, we've found out. Okay, so um, not one in particular is a particular issue to you. All, all of those various um, risks are... Yeah, I think, I think that we have a, a, a range of risks, to be, to be honest, and we have to keep all those in the same context. So, yeah, I think there's a... Yeah, I think they're just the, the immediate ones, uh, but there's all the operational risks as well of just resilience of systems and capability, uh, coping with increases suddenly in crime rates, uh, you know, as certain events happen. So yeah, I think the, the, but we have uh, operational risks, we have our systems risks, our ability to recover systems when they, when they do crash for some reason. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I think part of what we just do and try and do well. Okay, thank you, um, LAS. So, so we, we measure um, our uh, progress, if you like, with, uh, with digital scorecards that, uh, that have gone through our trust board and, uh, and been approved. Um, they're based on um, uh, NHS documents, what good looks like and who pays for, for what. Um, we're part of the, uh, the London Transformation Board, the London Digital Transformation Board. Um, and, and through that, uh, that, that, that uh, facility, we, we can bid for central funds from, uh, from the NHS, so not just from within our own capital, but, but also with a thing, a thing called Unified Tech Funds, UTF, that, uh, that's available for NHS Trust to, uh, to bid against. And we've been quite successful um, in, uh, in doing that. Uh, I would agree with um, the, uh, the challenges that uh, we in, – sorry, internally – um, we also report through to uh, uh, our uh, finance investment uh, committee, uh, and we also report through to uh, the the, um, uh, the the directors' meeting, which is known as uh, the executive committee. Um, so we do report progress, as well as having individual um, program boards for for each of the projects that are running, uh, which are then linked back through an IMT delivery board as well. Um, but we, I, I agree with the challenges that, uh, that colleagues have, uh, have set out. The other challenge that I would add to it is, uh, is activity. Um, the, the, the level of activity that, uh, that comes into the organisation um, is, uh, is significant at times and it does mean that uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, to engineer change. So most changes that, uh, that, that we do in an ambulance service uh, involve our control rooms. Um, so whether, you know, if we're changing telephone systems, radio systems, uh, CAD systems, etc. It all affects our, our control staff, uh, and that's quite a busy place at, uh, at the best of times. So uh, it's quite difficult when activity starts to rise to uh, to try and engineer a time where it's quite enough to uh, to take systems down and replace them. Um, so that is uh, the the, uh, the the big challenge for us at, uh, at the moment, and, and obviously trying to uh, to f um, get parts uh, from uh, the supply chain with uh, the issues that uh, that we have at, uh, at the moment as well as the recruitment. Uh, and the, the one that I would add on to the recruitment is that once you've got people is retaining them. Um, that is also a challenge as well. Okay, fine. I think the next question has more or less been answered, so. Thank you very much. Um, Assemblymember Duval is gonna come in quickly and then I'm gonna bring in Assemblymember Rogers. And even though this is my first meeting as chairman, I'm gonna start getting mean on time in a minute, just so I'm putting you all on notice. Assemblymember Duval. Thank you very much. Um, can I just go back to Airwave and the Emergency Services Network? I suppose it's a question to all three, but very quickly, in terms of picking up the cost of the ongoing debacle, about not implementation. Are you getting any support from central government in the extra costs that you're occurring, or are you still carrying those costs in your organisations? So the, 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 the cost to the Met directly at the moment is, is very small. So um, we effectively were expecting to have to refresh our radios because the ESN solution wasn't available. We've bought an airway solution, uh, Sapura radios, that there's about 30,000 that we've bought. Um, somewhat ironically... Sorry to interrupt, and you brought that because you couldn't wait for central government to do it. London not, went not, alone. Not, not quite, no. We, we, oh, we, right. we, we, we bought that because our existing radio fleet was coming to the end of oh. its useful life. So we had to have a refresh anyway. Mm. We couldn't buy an ESN one because there wasn't one. So we, we, we bought a standard airwave radio. Mm. Somewhat ironically, given now the extended 
um, uh, time we're going to wait for ESN, we're actually going to get the full benefit from those yep. 30,000. Um, obviously, there'll then be another decision point, probably. The, the life of the radios is normally around five years. We replace the batteries before then, but the radio itself is about five years. Frankly, it looks like we're going to get at least five years from these radios. I think the, the wider question around the cost of policing, or actually to, to all of our services, is actually the program itself obviously is using central resources mm. that are then not available to distribute to policing and, and other emergency services. Um, I think that's, that's the kind of macro challenge uh, that okay. we have with some of the central programs where, where they do become delayed. But the direct cost to the Met is, is very small. So we have a very small team of literally a, a, roughly a handful of people um, who, who we maintain because we still need to look at things like testing coverage for the new ESN networks, etc. Mm -hmm. So we still have to supply the program with responses to various questions, etc. But it's, it's, a, it's a handful of people. And quickly from the others, if there's anything else you want to... Um, the, the, again, for, for ambulance, there are no direct costs. It's picked up through the ambulance radio program. For, for us, it's more about um, our uh, development and progress. We would want to move a lot quicker than, uh, the, than we are. Uh, and we, we are in a queue of, uh, of nine, other amb nine other ambulance services. So where they get delayed, then it, it delays some of the work that, uh, that we're trying to do. So, so for us, it's just that, that, uh, that impact, really. I'm not aware it's an issue for us per se. Um, as I said, we do get a government grant to, to meet all or some of the cost. I, I don't recall which. Um, so I, I don't think, it's, unless we exceed our airtime allocation, of course, which is, which is variable and can vary slightly. So no, it's not, not really an issue. Okay. And then just move on, um, really going back to the issues of governance and data holding. And I, I particularly want to hone in on, on one of them about how do you, and I think you touched on it, of monitoring the use of data and a issues and one of the problems the MPS got into difficulty was over the gangs matrix system of capturing you know capturing data and the use of that data and all the rest of it so what, what steps have been taken to ensure that data sharing is now compliant with data protection laws and is there any lessons for other data storage for anybody else that the Met can share with others so I'll have to defer probably another date to colleagues in our data office who specialise in this area. Okay. I know they have put significant effort into making sure that we do have up-to-date data sharing agreements in place uh, with partners, so particularly with lo local authorities uh, and also with the health sector would be the two sort of key areas. So I know they have made significant progress. I'm afraid I don't have the numbers on that. In terms of, um, in general, how we share data and the safeguarding around it is basically we, we aim to avoid human error. So, for example... Um, as you know, there were a number of recommendations around how we managed the gang's matrix and how we shared it. Uh, one of the checks and balances that we put in place was actually a new sharing approach which didn't rely on email. Um, it's, it's an online sharing tool which gives us absolute audit over who has accessed yep. the gang's matrix. We, can know, we know who they are, we know where they were when they accessed it, and at any time we can remove that access by effectively cancelling the, the link that we provide them with. Um, so it is, that will be an example of where we have an absolute auditable process now to understand who is accessing our data and when, and from where, in fact, as well. And of course, that, learning the lessons of that must help in other data sharing Absolutely. across of authorities uh, in terms of yes. um, trying to protect us. And just in terms of, uh, you may not be able to answer this, but I think the committee might, might wish to know this. In terms of how do we keep technical technology changes keeping abreast with changes in legislation around those issues that you invest in a piece of kit and then find out you're trumped down the road because of some other legal requirement so how does that work and what's your thinking about that and do you talk about that with each other you know what's the process for that uh, some of those issues I mean, I mean, certainly within the Met, so our, our data office and our information assurance team and also our legal team work very closely together um, and give us regular advice and updates. Sometimes that requires us to, to make changes to an existing system. Um, usually we have some time, so normally legislation comes in and we can then set out a timetable of any changes we have to make. Uh, whenever we go to market, we ensure that we have the latest commercial and legal advice on actually the, the requirements. So, of, of, I mean, recent ones have been changes to G GDPR legislation. 
um, uh, issues around offshoring, what, you know, where data is held and who has access to it, and we ensure that both we're compliant and also that our suppliers are compliant. Um, so where new legislation comes out, we often are then contacting our supply base, um, who obviously have a very wide range of customers beyond us, and we're ensure and that invariably actually they're ready to give us the assurance because obviously they operate in a competitive market and they're keen to show that their products are keeping up with the latest legislative change. So for example, our cloud services, a lot of our storage which is online, actually one of the benefits of using these larger online solutions um, is actually they, they tend to keep up and keep pace with, with, with change. So it is an ongoing process. Um, it's not easy, but it is one that we're constantly checking. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Assembly Member Rogers, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have three questions, and I think I'll, I'll direct each one to a specific service. Um, so the first one will go to London Fire Brigade, um, if I may. Um, you've been on a fairly sort of rapid journey technologically um, over the last few years. So uh, in that journey, how are you ensuring that um, products and services are tracked throughout development and testing and that any problems are picked up at an early stage? And also, how do you make sure that any new products and services have value for money built into them? Okay, thank you. So, um, essentially, everything we do is, is project-based. So, all, all projects are of a, of a governance wrapper. So, um, you talk about um, technology itself is, is not an enabler. It's, it's not a, an end in itself. It's an enabler. So, uh, invariably, the projects will have a defined set of benefits specified at the front. Um, and as the project progresses, obviously, projects can, can be delayed. Scope can change. Benefits may change. But at the end of the project, the the, the benefits realization process should actually determine whether we said. What, what, what we're going to do, we actually did and, and realised the benefits. Those benefits may be realised at project closure or sometime after project closure, depending on the, the, the type of project and the number of uh, the, the length of time it takes for, for the for benefits start to be accrued. Um, in, ter in terms of value for money, um, it's a difficult question to answer, really. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do is, is a direct response to an organisational requirement. Um, so, for example, frontline clue crews probably couldn't do without mobile data terminals now. Um, how do you how do you measure that benefit? Um, I would say it's quite quite difficult actually. Um, if you talk to the crews, you know they they say that they couldn't do without it. And if, certainly if if they fail, um, you know it's 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 uh, almost a, almost a situation where an appliance may have to come off a run if a mobile data terminal fails. And not form not formally, but they rely so much for access to risk, access to chemical databases, etc. Both on the way to and at the fire ground. So. Um, it's very difficult to measure benefits for a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, it's not something, you know, if it's a pure investor save t type, type project, you can actually, over time, track, track the benefits of that. But a lot of the stuff that, that we tend to do uh, tends to be very fire service specific and it's in relation to an organisational requirement or an infrastructure upgrade. Okay. I mean, mobile data terminals, of course, they're kind of they're absolutely sort of mission critical to the firefighters' daily lives. But maybe I'm thinking more something like the online home fire safety visits, uh, the, the tool that, that the fire brigade brought in, um, how would you measure the value for money of a project like that? And I don't know what the kind of take-up has been, but sure, there's a fairly big investment um, to, make that, to make that happen. I mean, how do you, how do you sort of measure the value for money with the numbers of people who are using it? I don't have specific information about that system in terms of stats that I can, I can give to you, but obviously uh, any, any, any situation like that, system like that, where people can actually perform a function online that, that doesn't require a personal set of people to go to a premises um, with all the consequential travel, uh, etc. There must be benefits uh, in, in that loop somewhere. Uh, I don't have anything that I can quote to you that, that um, tells you what they are, um, I'm afraid. No. Thank you. Uh, is that something you might be able to find out? And I'm certainly certainly ask the question, yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. Great. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my next question I'm going to put to the Met Police. Um, when you're designing products and services for use by staff, what principles and controls do you use to ensure that the end user needs are met? So Dan, if you want to take that one. Uh, yep, so we um, in invariably um, gather together a, a group of subject matter experts, so people who are going to use, use the system. Um, it very much varies on the system that, that we're dealing with. So if, if, we're, if we're building one, then it's, a, it's an iterative process of involving the users in um, firstly looking at, at wireframes and mock-ups of actually what, what we're building and then moving into an iterative development process. O often we're buying an off-the-shelf product, um, in which case it's about engaging um, those individuals into um, the procurement process. Um, so typically we'll do what's sometimes referred to as a show and tell. 
So they'll come and they'll actually see the product as part of the selection process. Um, and we can actually build that into the to the scoring mechanism. It won't be the only thing that we measure, but one of the many characteristics will be around actually the, the extent to which the, the user need is met, i.e. they find it easier to use, typically that it's intuitive. We also look at the use of assistive technologies to ensure that actually looking at whether the systems have the right, have the right capabilities and are amenable to the use of, for example, screen reading software uh, for those who are partially sighted or, or, or blind members of staff. So, so yes, so we, there's, a, there's a range, I think is what I'd say, and it, it varies according to the, whether we're, we're, we're building and or buying the product. But we, we typically have a, a group of users that we engage. Okay, interesting. I mean, I think talking about, um, uh, in terms of the Met Police, talking about end users and delivery, um, we're kind of, we're, a lot of time we're talking about police officers, aren't mm -hmm. we, and how police officers use technology. And I think if you're talking about delivery, talking about police officers, you have to be thinking about the capability and capacity of those end users, of those police officers and the organisation. And then you have to be thinking about how does anything else um, impact on how we deliver the core capabilities of the organisation, which is for the Met, obviously, it's preventing and detecting crime. And in, in reading our briefing today and listening to the questions, I was very much reminded of um, a a discussion we had at Police and Crime Committee uh, last December, and we had Matt Parr, uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, talking about the Mayor's draft police and crime plan. And I, his comments are very interesting. And Darren, I, as your chair of the National Police Technology Council, so you, I'm sure, have some views on this. So I'm going to uh, paraphrase some of the things that he said. Um, about police and technology um, and the delivery of technological services. So he's talking about um, a big move to digital crime in the last 10 or 15 years, not just in the sense of um, crimes committed online, but the huge amount of digital evidence and the subsequent uh, complexity of investigations. Um, and he's highlighting a problem that's, that is not just in London, but is national in terms of a lack of trained investigators, which in itself has a massive effect, a profound effect on the service that the public receive. Um, and then he, he talks about even not, not just cyber crime or cyber enabled crime, but something like an assault charge or a sexual offence charge. There's a huge digital footprint that comes with that kind of crimes. Uh, that kind of crime and he says that the police is struggling to keep up with the digital revolution it feels like it is 10 years behind and not catching up so I guess my question to you is do you recognize um, the Met in that description and how are you dealing with these kinds of issues in the delivery of strategies so, so I think what I'd say is I recognize the challenges absolutely um, that we, we share them as you're probably not surprised I think we've moved from a world where um, the digital investigation was almost a specialist function to a world where, as you've, you've described, digital is, there's an element of digital in the majority of crime, as you say, whether it actually it's um, perpetrated digitally or there's a digital footprint that left, that's left behind it. I think our approach to that, I'd say, is probably twofold. One, as you've highlighted, is, is training. It's ensuring that, firstly, our officers have an awareness, so when they come to a crime scene, what should they be looking for? what are the devices within the household that may actually hold digital evidence. Um, it's normally in excess of 10 devices in most households these days. Even things like a PlayStation can be used in, the, you know, in, a, in an online crime, for example. So first, it's around, it's around that training piece. How do they secure that evidence um, at, you know, in, the mo in, the, in the best way? Actually, somewhat ironically, normally the best way of securing the evidence is just to unplug the device and not to actually turn it off gracefully because then we capture, we freeze exactly the, the state the device was in at the time that the, that, that the crime was per perpetrated. Um, and then the other one is actually tooling. So it's looking at how we can provide our officers with tools that enable them effectively make their jobs easier. So for example, we have kiosks now in every BCU in London that enables them to plug in a device um, and that will then interpret that device for them. Um, one of our KPIs that John referred to is actually looking at the number of officers trained in, in the use of those, those um, kiosks. We have a, uh, another solution we use at the moment where we're looking at um, online crime and particularly child abuse, where uh, we work in partnership with the Home Office. They've provided us with devices where, again, we can do a very rapid triage of the devices that we find at a location. Um, that solution will look for particular 
you know, videos, pictures, etc., that, that are known to, to policing. And where it identifies that on the device, we'll then seize that device. And it means we, we don't have to seize all 10 devices. We can actually focus in our investigations then on, on the higher risk um, devices within the household. Um, there, there are probably some other examples, but hopefully that gives you a flavour of it. it's a combination of training and tooling to mean that virtually every officer then has a digital capability because, as you've said, whenever they approach a crime scene, the chances are there's going to be a digital element yeah, to it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you talk about training a lot because it's clear that, you know, at the core of a lot of what Matt Parr is talking about is a training um, issue and a lack, mm -hmm. a lack of training. So, mm -hmm. I mean, how are you, you obviously know the scale of the challenge that officers face, but how are you engaging the rest of the organisation in that training need? So we, we work quite closely with our, our transformation team and also our professionalism directorate. Um, they in turn are very linked into the College of Policing. So uh, the College of Policing produce actually some very good comprehensive um, guidance and help for our officers. Um, to be honest, a lot of the digital department's job is make sure that guidance is then available to our officers and they're ab actually able to access it easily, uh, both preemptively, but also then when they're actually undertaking investigation, can we provide them tooling to help them assess the scene, um, etc. So we're finding, for example, with things like Teams, uh, um, then our officers can can access the expertise almost you know back back at the ranch as it were within our specialist teams to actually give them advice on how to deal with a particular you know crime scene you know digitally as it as it were so yeah it's a combination there but we we work very closely with uh, you know colleagues in transformation and professionalism who are ultimately responsible for actually how we implement change in the organisation. And did I hear you correctly earlier, you mentioned you have user groups uh, who help you with the development of, of new products uh, and services. New products, yes. And uh, wh where would those um, user groups be drawn from? Across the Met or...? Uh, well, it d depends, on, depends on the problem we're trying to solve. So if it's a uh, new forensic so system, for example, then typically it would be from the forensics department or anyone else who's going to use that system. So we try and get a cross-section of users Sometimes it's officers, sometimes staff. Typically it's both, because a lot of our systems are used by officers and, and members of staff. Thank you. That's very interesting. Th thank you very much. Um, my final question, I'll go to the London Ambulance um, Service. Uh, you've, I think it sounds like you've also had quite a lot of technological innovation in the last few years. So um, what level of independence uh, do officers have, staff have, to develop uh, innovative solutions to local issues? Um, and in, is, so for example, is design and delivery a centralised process? Um, how, do you, how do you encourage local innovation? <laughs> um, it, it's a, I, I guess that's a two-edged sword. Um, with, with local innovation because what you do find or what I, I think we have done in the past uh, in, in LAS is, done quite a, a, is, is to do quite a lot of development but then not to, uh, to have the, uh, the, the, the appropriate um, structure in place to support those, uh, th those innovations once, uh, once the people that have innovated them have moved on um, and generally that, uh, that, 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 that does happen. So what we do try uh, to do is uh, is to encourage innovation, encourage um, uh, thinking um, ar around what we're doing, uh, and ask them to uh, to bring the ideas to to us. Um, our preference um, is is now to uh, to buy wherever we can off the shelf, um, and make sure that uh, that we we can support it going forward, and, and to move away from uh, from in-house development. We don't see ourselves as a software development house. Um, anymore, we, we would prefer to focus our time and efforts on uh, on, on patients. I know, uh, do you want to jump in there? Because I know you've done some work with EPCR, etc. If you want to answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and, and coming on to um, previous colleagues' uh, comments about the user being in the centre of that design, it's so important. And uh, for uh, in situations where there isn't an off-the-shelf product, um, I've got a recent example, in fact, we're building it at the moment, is our access to the London Care Record um, in a mobile environment. Our clinicians obviously work in a hostile environment. Uh, their bandwidth is reduced with our um, dealing with our sickest patients. Um, uh, we're having to develop a product. Um, but doing that under a safe, governed process, um, assisted by the region, and also in collaboration with uh, Centre of Excellence, we're actually working with the Royal Free Hospital, their innovation team, um, to create a digital product with, with um, users in the, um, in the centre of that design and, and um, to make sure that it's going to be um, fit for purpose. Um, but then uh, ensuring that the vendor we're using absolutely uh, supports the product for 
um, the next five years is, is critically important so we don't end up in a position with an unsupported product that we've already talked about. Thank you. Um, I, I'm conscious of time, so maybe if you could make it just very brief. Yes, yeah, certainly, thank you. And yeah, just, just to build on that, so one thing we do see a lot of um, interest in, we have about 120 officers who are trained up, so we actually produce our own uh, mobile applications using Power Apps. I think we're the biggest public sector user actually globally in doing that. Uh, and it, it gets a lot of interest because it helps them create their own mobile solution to what are the eight things I need to do in this case. Um, what is good about it, it's a low code thing, you don't need to code it, um, but it lets them do it literally in days or weeks in a controlled environment uh, and therefore we publish it out to the rest of the force. So we see a real actually strong innovation but also officers producing their own solutions in a controlled environment that enable efficiency and effectiveness and I think for us that's a very positive sign of how we're going mobile first as part of our strategy. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And we're moving to the third section now of the meeting, which is about outcomes and um, what are the outcomes of those strategies that we identified earlier. There's probably a point now where, from that last section of the discussion, we've, we've covered some of this area, so I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of that. So um, if we could be mindful that the police need to go in an hour as well, if we could uh, get the answers as succinct as possible and the questioning as well. Um, and I'm sure we're going to see a great example of that with Assembly Member Sahota. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's called setting you up. <laughs> um, okay, I'll start with, 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 um, with, with you, Darren. Um, what technical and policy barriers are there to sharing data with other teams and organizations, and how are these being addressed to your digital strategies? So I think, um, so, so we, we have, I think, uh, proper constraints over some things that we share so you know we, we gather some very sensitive information and and under legislative framework we can we can only share it with with certain organizations certain individuals under certain circumstances so I think that's it, it's both a constraint but also it's, it's a necessary constraint I think if we then look beyond that of where it is some data that we want to and can share is looking at how we we do that so um, a good example probably is across policing um, um, sponsored by the National Police Technology Council, um, we've rolled out Office 365 across every police force now. I th actually, I think there are two that haven't quite implemented yet, but they're about to. So that enables us to have a, a, a sharing platform across policing, so we can share then um, data, obviously things like video calls, etc., are much easier, but actually a lot of it is about how we can share data and information in a secure environment because what we're assured is that every police force has implemented that solution in a similar, if not the same way. So we can be certain that if we send some of our data to another force using that medium, when they receive it, it's going to be as secure as when we sent it. So it's very important that we follow similar patterns so that when we share data, we're able to do that. So that's an example. I think where we're sharing with third parties where maybe we have less say in actually how they do it, then it's about, uh, and we mentioned the gang's matrix recently, um, it's actually around us ensuring that when we do share something, we have the right checks and balances in place. So for example, we have a technology at the moment that enables us to share in a way that then prevents the in use individual from printing or downloading. And we can set that at quite a granular level. So we can say where they can view it. We can even expire that share. So we can say where they can view it for five days. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the five days, if they went back to that link, it just wouldn't work. We can specify that they have to log in with a particular account in order to share. We can then add extra layers of security like passwords, etc. So um, we can set this quite granularly. What we actually do is we set a default, which is relatively safe. So most things that we create in the Met, by default, you can't just share externally because then that safeguards both the user and also the person whose data we hold. So our officers and staff have to take a deliberate decision to say, yes, I want to share this, and I want to share this with somebody outside of the organization. So that's two decisions they've made. And then if they, and then they, there's then the type of sharing they do. So we, 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 we make it easy, sorry, we make it difficult to make an easy mistake, I mm -hmm. think is probably what we'd say. But then we do then enable that sharing using appropriate technologies. We're trying to move away from email. Email is very much a sort of almost a fire and forget solution yeah, you send someone an email you don't know what they then do with that email whereas if we can share using our systems and then the data is retained in our systems and then the, and we can then control how it's used another good example that would be body-worn video 
So all of our body worn video goes into a, a repository which is controlled by the Met. When it's then shared with the Crown Prosecution Service or then on with defence, it actually remains in our system. Mm -hmm. So we're not creating additional copies, which there's then a risk that we don't know where those copies have gone. We know it's, it's more controlled, auditable in our solution. So, so that we know who, who can actually access that data. And how about when officers move from one, from one force to another force, better vetting issues, that HR policies, HR files, are they shared also or openly? Or um, or to be honest, I, th I think I probably have to defer to HR colleagues as to, as to what the, the vetting rules are between forces. I know they can be subtly different. Mm -hmm. So, for example, within the Met, we obviously have a responsibility for counter-terrorism nationally as well. So I believe we do do some additional checks, for example, on, on our officers because there is more likelihood they'll come into contact with slightly more sensitive data than maybe some other forces. Mm -hmm. But obviously other forces deal with terrorism as well. So um, I think probably HR colleagues would be better to answer that okay. question, yeah. to be honest. Thank you. And the same question about the sharing of data for the London Ambulance Service. Um, I, I guess that uh, for, for, for us it's not about uh, technical constraints. We, we try not to have any technical constraints. The, the constraints are all governance, I think, as has been described, uh, and most of those relate to, uh, to patient access uh, type, uh, type, type requests. Um, we do have uh, uh, quite a lot of facilities already that allows us uh, f uh, to exchange data with other ambulance services. So, for example, uh, you can have a... Uh, a, a, a trouble nine call that, uh, that, that is for, uh, for, for the LAS going into West Midlands Ambulance Service. Uh, as soon as they register the call on their system, then uh, there's uh, an automatic program that picks that up and transfers it directly into, uh, into the LAS call stack um, and vice versa. So that happens uh, across the whole of, uh, of the UK, including Scotland and, uh, and, and Wales as well. Um, so that allows uh, any calls to go to any place uh, that will then end up in the right, uh, the right dispatch stack. Um, with regards to, uh, to, to other, uh, other access points, um, for, for us the important thing is around um, uh, data categorization. We, we have a, a requirement to, uh, to be compliant with uh, a thing called DSPT, which is the Data Security Protection Toolkit, which is an NHS um, standard that, uh, that, that we, we the, in actual fact, it's uh, this month that we have to report our compliance with it. Um, there are something like 90 assertions, um, in excess of 90 assertions, in that, uh, in that requirement, uh, and it's a mix of, uh, of information security and information governance um, requirements, such as having um, uh, uh, data sharing agreements in place, etc. So that, that's really how we, we protect ourselves. I wouldn't say that we're, 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 we're completely there at the moment. We, we've moved our data storage to, uh, to external um, tier three data centers now um, for, for, for more security. Um, but we've still got work to do on facilitating transfer of data around the system. Um, one of our um, advantages and disadvantages uh, being uh, on a regional uh, footprint, so the whole of London, is that, uh, that, that we, our, our, um, our staff, our paramedics and technicians operate across the whole of London. They're not constrained by, by boundaries, um, but yet hospitals use different systems, and so therefore we, we have to um, allow for that. Uh, and, and as uh, Stuart, I think, pointed out earlier on, um, there is the One London uh, health record that, uh, that, that, that is helpful because that becomes... Um, almost the, uh, the go-between to allow us to move data from our systems to any, any other hospital system. You talk about hospital system, but how about with primary care? Are you linked well with primary care? Do you want to pick that up? Uh, so I think we're getting there, uh, is, uh, is the honest answer. And again, uh, uh, the London Care Record is, um, is core to our advancement. Uh, in terms of centralising the records. So historically, uh, we could access some of the uh, information, the clinical information via a thing called summary care record, mm -hmm. uh, but it had basic, uh, or it has basic uh, health information. The London care record, a shared care record, um, has far more um, detailed access, but isn't specific to GP, but includes GP, uh, and it's a much more holistic um, view of um, uh, that data. And I think, uh, ag again, uh, we, were, we were talking about um, uh, uh, data in that actually I think Londoners will see second to banking health data is the most precious thing they own um, uh, and it's it's critically important we we, we remember as uh, as uh, an organization and the wider NHS 
how important that is and our structures and governance is incredibly strict in terms of how we set up the data sharing agreements to make sure that we're accessing and using the data in an appropriate manner. So um, uh, citizens expect us to access clinical data when they call upon our services and we found that from the, Murray, um, the recent Murray work um, but also how we use data for the purposes of research and personal care records is, is equally important. So, I mean, as more and more decisions are made near the patients by the ambulance service, I mean, are you able to see their records, like their past medical history, their medications? So when a crew is coming out of the patient's house, are you able to see that sort of data? Yes, absolutely, uh, and that's growing uh, in terms of the the detail of that uh, that information. It, it's also really important that, again, I, I spoke earlier about bandwidth. Um, uh, having access to lots of information can be a negative, so uh, having access to the right information is critically important, um, uh, and, and some of the tools we're building are, uh, are narrowing down how we access that, that data. But that is at the patient side and, and will transform... Uh, as we uh, enter the next couple of years, transform how clinicians are making decisions at the patient side. And of course, vice versa, the, the information that you have made, decisions your crews have made, how does it, how does it get feed back into the hospitals and the primary care system? So again, as part of our journey uh, with the London Care Record being in the centre, our commitment is to publishing our 999 and our 111 records into the London Care Record. So as soon as we've um, had an interaction with a patient, we publish that information uh, to any other clinicians and social care uh, um, provider who has access to the with the right role-based access to that information can instantly see um, the care that we've given and we're also working to flow data from our electronic patient care records straight into hospital systems one of the frustrations of patients is having to retell their story uh, and retell their and um, I think we've all been in the um, environment where we've had to um, uh, tell us uh, you know our address for instance multiple times um, we're trying to engineer that out in terms of flowing data into the system so we're just um, making sure that we've got the right patient in front of us rather than repeating a story Good. and, and, and uh, the same question about to, to the London Fire Brigade about this, uh, about you sharing data with, with other organisations? I think predominantly in, in our context, um, the, the, the area that most I hear um, discussion around is sharing cross-border information with other, um, other services. So when London fire appliances go across to Surrey or Essex and, and vice versa, uh, information about risk, etc. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the National Fire Chiefs Council, Council are now defining a digital and data standard for the fire service. And I think this area will become more... Um, what's the word, formalised uh, and will, will expand going forward. But one area I'd like to touch on also is something that we are slowly work, working, to for, working to, towards sorry, um, is um, sharing operational incident data via the um, MATE system, multi-agency incident transfer. Um, it's been delayed from our perspective for a number of, number of reasons uh, and others, but this will allow real-time sharing of, of CAD information between, for example, Met Police and us and anyone else who's signed up to the Code of Connection and connected to the, to the MATE system. So... That's something we're very much um, committed to, uh, to adopting going forward, but uh, that's probably the extent of our, our sharing of data at the moment, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, just, just back to the, the police service again. Um, I mean, how, you, how are you measuring um, the difference, the rollout of, the, uh, of information on the, or to your uh, or to devices or frontline staff is making? What difference, how are you measuring the, the, the impact it's having, this, this, this technology rollout to the frontline staff? Um, so if we look at our tablets and laptops, for example, as, as that's the example you, you, you've raised, um, so the, the principal benefit from, from that rollout was to ensure that our officers can spend more time um, out and not in the police station. Uh, what we do have very detailed information on, therefore, is how many times they create, for example, a crime record on their tablet while out in the field compared to doing it um, with, within, a, within a police station. So that, that's the principal measure. Um, the last numbers I had, which admittedly were, were slightly old, is, is something like 240,000 hours in mm. a year mm. we've calculated. Now, that's a very broad brush. That's assuming a certain number of minutes to fill out a crime report. Um, actually, they're doing it in the field, because we know, and we know for a fact it's being done in the field because we have the, the audit data to tell us where they were when they did it. So, so that's, that's an example of how we've ensured. Now, we, we don't convert that into, into money, 
because it's clearly not a saving. It's, it's, a, it's a change to a working practice, which we hope benefits the public. It certainly benefits the officers as well, because they're, they're out and about much more. They're not having to come in at the end of their shift to, to fill out all the IT systems. They can do it as they go. It also means we have more up-to-date intelligence available. If we're updating the systems as we've been to each incident, um, then that data is then available to other, other officers as well. Um, so that's a, a probably a worked mm. example of how, how we've done that. Uh, the same question to the ambulance service? Uh, probably an um, example of that is uh, EPCR, um, our, our electronic uh, patient care record. Again, um, we, we wouldn't necessarily expect um, change or, or, or uh, improvements in, in terms of time to come from that because um, they ask a lot more questions and, uh, and they take people through a process of making sure that we've got all of, uh, of the information. Um, where we would expect to, uh, to gain is, uh, uh, Stuart mentioned earlier on, that, uh, that, that we are piloting uh, a transfer of care at the moment whereby we automatically download from the EPCR tablets onto the hospital system, uh, which could um, uh, re reduce uh, time spent at uh, on a hospital, um, freeing up uh, crews to, uh, to, to, to go back out and, uh, and, and, and continue working. So for us, it's not really about savings, it's about creating more capacity from the, uh, the time that, uh, that we can create with the systems, I think. One of the things, of course, would be that you, 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 one of the targets with the ambulance services is how many transfers you do or how many transfers you don't do to the hospitals, okay? I mean, has that improved that sort of decision-making? Uh, so, uh, yes, it, uh, it has, uh, and it's growing. And I think access to uh, that clinical data um, uh, uh, in terms of we are risk-averse, um, we want to do the right thing for the patient uh, to make sure they get the best care uh, um, and access to that information that clinical information um, really increases the quality of the, de the clinical decisions that are being made so the more you know about the patient um, if the patient's unable to tell us the the more informed um, and uh, 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 more effective decision you can make in terms of where the clinical care is now the savings are uh, difficult to quantify and I think multiple organizations have had a go at it um, uh, but in terms of savings across the region um, uh, uh, we are saving an awful lot of money um, but it's spread across multiple organizations so if we're not conveying a patient to hospital for, a, for example there's clearly a saving there but actually we've transferred some of the cost over to the community um, so it, it's quite hard to track mm -hmm. but, but um, we are trying to tease some of those numbers out because um, uh, you know, that's helping with our direction of travel and our strategic approach. Uh, um, yes, finally, I mean, I mean, I can understand that treating a patient at home appropriately is the right thing to do. But sometimes things go wrong. A wrong decision. How do you get that feedback that the things haven't gone right? Is there a mechanism for capturing that sort of feedback? Yeah, we've got several um, mechanisms in place. So one is the obvious is that patient makes us aware um, that the care we give them may have been, um, uh, um, uh, you know, the decision may have been challenged in terms of, you know, they ended up in hospital or something uh, adverse happens. Um, uh, and, and we then take that information and we, uh, we uh, explore those incidents to make sure that we're learning from those uh, incidents. But also we monitor our own information. So we've got a thing called a recontact audit. Um, so we monitor um, patients that have contacted us and if they recontact us and end up um, um, being conveyed to hospital, we explore why that happened. Now, with health, th sometimes that's just the progression of an illness. Um, uh, um, it, you know, there's a bit of an unknown quantity there. Um, they might respond to a treatment or they may not. Um, and, and so quite often it's entirely appropriate that that happened. But sometimes it might be that, that something was missed. Uh, and so we're keen to... Uh, continue to explore to make sure that's happened and I think if we look ahead at the next five years specifically talking about technology um, there are technologies that are going to be able to um, you know increase our abilities to be able to do that you know artificial intelligence uh, machine learning etc in terms of the huge data sets we've got um, being able to learn from the data we hold uh, is really quite exciting. Thank you. I think, Chair, I think I've covered everything. Thank you very much. Um, Assemblymember Hall, did you want to come in here? Thank you. I'll, I'll be uh, very quick. It's good to hear our transformation is happening in all three um, different areas. But many of us believe that there are fortunes to be saved in collaboration. Do you, do you, do you all think that? Do you all think that perhaps you should all get together more and work 
towards a goal of far greater integration? I'll, I'll start with arguments. I, th I think there's always room for, for, for improvement in terms of, uh, of, of integration, but, but I think I mentioned fr from a, an, a, an ambulance perspective, um, I, I think the statistic is something like 95% of our contacts um, uh, involve us handing over to another healthcare professional. Um, uh, and whereas, you know, maybe five, ten percent of our work involves working with uh, the, uh, the, the other blue light colleagues. Um, so it's not a significant amount of, uh, of our work. Um, but as I say, th th there's, it, doesn't, it doesn't preclude us from doing it. We still see it in, in, in three ways, uh, working with blue light colleagues, uh, working across the, uh, the, the, the London region, the, the, the NHS wide, uh, and then our national commitments around other ambulance services. Um, but, but I think you know, we, we could do better, but equally we could do better at uh, collaborating with, uh, w with other ambulance services. You, you know, I, I think there's, th th there are a number of areas that we, we could improve on. Um, but I, I'm not sure that it's... it's um, that, that I've, been, I've been working around the ambulance services for about 30 years, and I think since I came in, uh, there's always been this debate about whether the ambulance service is the, the, the emergency arm of the health service or the, the health arm of the emergency services. Uh, and and that, that, that sort of um, tension's always been, uh, been there as far as uh, the ambulance service is concerned. But I think that we, we work quite well together now. Please. Yes, so, so I, I do agree. I think, I think you know, collaboration is always a good thing and a positive thing. Uh, I think the, um, probably the, 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 the health check around that is sometimes though it's easy just to say we're doing something very similar the the operational demands of say policing can be somewhat different to say ambulance in terms of volume and kind of of speed of of you know of escalation so um as you start to collaborate you sometimes realize it's not all as it's not all like for like there are subtle differences and they are sometimes quite quite different but i do th i do think that what we do and certainly more probably nationally as well though is we do engage with other forces in various governance boards and everything, I think very effectively. Uh, clearly that, that is often just to find out what they've done, what lessons can we learn, how do we avoid mistakes they might have encountered sadly, uh, and that helps with our big investment in our programs. And we share, that's a two-way process. But also I think for us, the other part of collaboration and thinking is more and more time spent at the end-to-end -end journey if I look at citizens and policing, it's what's the end to end? How do we take it from our, their first contact to them having a good experience? Looking at it from that perspective it is important for us. Therefore, it means in, in the case of policing, you know, dealing with, well, actually healthcare, because of, you know, people, mental health and other issues are part of the ecosystem. How do we work with them to look at that picture? But with Ministry of Justice, CPS, the judiciary, by looking at things end to end, we get a better view of where we can add value in that in that in that link, uh, and that's why I think we do better, more effective collaboration as well. Thank you. Um, I chair a national group of the um, of the heads of IT, CIOs and directors for the fire service, and certainly collaboration is something that we constantly discuss. And I think in any sector, probably vertical collaboration is always more attractive or initially easier than, than horizontal collaboration. Um, so, so we do try in that respect, and, and there's some, some evidence that um, some of the feedback coming back from that in terms of um, helping each other out with, with various things uh, is beneficial. But in terms of across uh, horizontal uh, collaboration, I think my answer to that is from a fire service perspective, we do try. Um, certainly every major procurement that I'm involved in that's over 150k in value um, goes by the um, collaboration group, group collaboration board in the GLA. So. Um, there's a significant um, opportunity there on everything that's, you know, because my governance limit is 150k. Everything above that needs to go for deputy mayor approval, as I'm sure everyone knows. So, so really, there is an opportunity there um, for any organisation doing something similar to actually join that collaboration uh, in terms of procurement. And I think, uh, without giving away too much because it's commercially sensitive, we're actually doing something with the Met Police at the moment in terms of mobile tele tele telephony, which, from our perspective, we're hoping to represent a significant saving. So. I think my answer is, um, yes, we probably could do more, but we are trying, uh, and it is not, not always as straightforward as um, it may see, seem from the, from the surface outside. Okay, I'm sure we'll pick this up when we've got more time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assembly Member Clark. Well, thank you, Chair. Am I correct that the police are, are you leaving at one? 
Is that correct? At the 12.30. At 12.30, sorry. Okay. Um, I, I'll, I'll pose my first question to you, Darren. I, you, you picked up on um, quite a bit about how uh, investments in digital channels are improving the experience of, of, of the Met Police. I'm just wondering if you have any way to measure the difference this has made to um, the ease of communication with the service users themselves. So, um, I, I don't think directly. So, uh, when, when we do survey our end users, um, they're not always specific on the channel they've used to, to contact us. What we do know is any digital interaction then goes through exactly the same process we would for a telephony. So, it's not automated. It comes in electronically, and then we put it through the same triage process as we would follow for a 101 call. Typically, they're non-emergencies that are reported online. So it goes through the same you know, human triage process, um, and then people with exactly the same training will then decide how to deal with that, that incident. Um, sometimes it will result in us phoning the individual. Sometimes it will result in us arranging a visit. Sometimes we'll actually reply electronically where it's most appropriate. But that process is exactly the same as we would follow with a, with a 101 call. So I don't, no, I can't say it's, okay. it's definitely better. I, I can say it's the same process and the same experience that you'd have if, if, you, if you dialed 101. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if anyone has, has a way of measuring that because I, I do think these are services that you're obviously heavily investing in and it would mm. be interesting to know if you have a way of measuring the uh, improved user experience. I, I can take it away. I, I okay. say I'm, I'm not aware we've got a separate statistic for that, but I'll, I, I'll yeah. come back to you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, over to Julian. I'm just getting back to the 999i that we were speaking about earlier. Um, how is the improved situational awareness of incidents for the brigade, um, and what learning has been taken from the introduction of this that can be used for other projects going forward? Well, I think the situational awareness um, by the nature of the product is that um, a person reporting a fire, for example, obviously has um, can see the fire probably before anyone else can. So you know, there's an immediate advantage to there. So um, we can then stream that video back to control in real time, record it for a period of time, or take still photos, etc. Um, so so I, th I think situational awareness. Um, the crews can then, uh, um, sorry, the control staff can then look at the fire, and obviously most fires have a pre predetermined attendance anyway, but um, they can make on you know on the spur decisions to actually vary that response so so i think that's that's a positive so what was the second part of the question how can the learning that that you've had um inform future decisions on on new technologies you might implement well actually, actually i think there's scope to um perhaps widen the use of that product so um we have a number of um fire safety inspecting officers that actually traverse london doing doing fire, fire inspections mm -hmm. um one of the things that we've discussed is how we can use that technology or similar technology to allow them to actually remotely get someone to walk around a, a building and actually record compliance uh, against a particular notice. So I think it's got quite quite wide potential uh, going forward, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and then, Darren, uh, coming back to you, and I, I could be wrong on this, but my assumption is that of, of the blue light services, the, the ones who are kind of most likely to be contacted digitally uh, would be the police. But is, does, does that seem correct to you? Uh, I, I believe so, based yeah. on, on call handling. So I, yeah. I believe we, we take more calls than, than any other service, yes. Uh, so, so one thing is that um, uh, last year, the UK Consumer Digital Index from Lloyds Bank found that 3% of Londoners, so about 290,000 people, are offline and digitally excluded. How are you ensuring that those who are digitally excluded have equal and fair access to information and services? So, so I think it's about choice. So mm -hmm. we ensure that the, the digital service we've, we've, we've created for, for example, crime reporting, as I've described, mirrors our 101 service. So we, have, uh, you know, we, we don't provide any advantage per se to someone using the digital service. People prefer it. it to be honest, it, it's slightly more, slightly more efficient for us, um, but we still provide the 101 channel. I think what I'd also say is the more people that use the digital service, actually then our callers get a better service because then we're not taking because we can handle those calls slightly more efficiently we then have got more call handlers available to, to deal with the 101 calls for those who either choose to use a 10 the telephone or as, as you say the, the the small percentage who don't have another option yeah. it enables us to provide a better 101 service and in terms of like outbound communication obviously it's 
really easy for me to look at the Twitter feed or the website of the Metropolitan Police, but yeah. I can understand if I was, uh, for people who are digitally excluded, they mm. they might not have that. Um, is, is there anything that, that that's thought of kind of more locally where um, information is now, is there any is there any sort of further thought to be, to, 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 for, for um, communicating locally, either by leaflets or street stalls and that sort of thing? So, so we do, and obviously the, the core, we're here to talk about digital, but the, yeah. the core of what we do in policing actually is, is on the street yeah. uh, and, and dealing directly uh, with the public through our, our ward officers, um, uh, you know, our, our ward offices as well, so people know where, where they, can, they can have access to police, and obviously the police will, will, will walk in the streets. So um, obviously we're focusing a lot on the digital channel, but that all our other channels are, st are still there, both sort of face to face and, of course, through the media as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and this one, last one's for Julian. But if anyone else wanted to jump in, that's fine. Um, I'm just wondering how uh, how the LFB is uh, working with national services, and what is what is the emphasis on collaboration with London organisations versus collaboration with other national services? Um, the only my answer to that really would reflect back to the comments I made earlier, but we, we you know, I, I chair a national group for, of ICT managers and we do talk about a range of subjects, um, ranging from cyber security to market intelligence to procurement. Um, I'm not aware that um, from an IT perspective, digitally, we, we, we collaborate nationally with other organisations outside of that. Um, I may be wrong, but I, I struggle to think of examples at, at, at the moment. Okay. Come in, Darren. Uh, I mean, if I can come in. So, um, we, we talked a little bit about collaboration in you know, be between us, which you know, I think is, is is effective. I think also when I think about the policing ecosystem, so uh, as I say, it's, it's sharing patterns and, and the way we implement. Uh, jo John talked earlier about around power apps. So this is where you know, individuals can, can create an app. Um, because across policing, we have the same uh, infrastructure. We actually have quite um, a vibrant market in actually then sharing those apps and those creations between between forces. So that's that's pretty effective. Um, there are around, I think, 40 apps at the moment that are in a, a very private app store, as you might imagine, but then enables other forces to then to then use that. So people aren't reinventing the wheel. I think the other thing we, we've not really talked about is, is cross-government sharing. And this is particularly around where we can access you know, government licensing deals, government hardware deals, and government sort of telecommunications and, and connectivity deals. Mm. Um, it, the Met is large, but it's, it's actually 50,000 seats. Compared to government buying power, it, it's, it, it's, it's actually not that big in the scheme of things. Um, and we can then access that, that buying power as well, and where we see some significant economies, particularly in our licensing um, deals. Uh, we, we get some, some, some very good solutions with that. And then, as Julian said, any, anything we do do in the Met, we do look to share um, across the GLA ecosystem. So any framework that we create then we do give the option for, for others to, to come in with us. And if anyone can benefit from our buying power, then, then we're obviously very happy to, to help, as, as we're trying to do with the telephony at the moment uh, with, with Julian. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just, just to pick up very quickly on something that Assemblymember Clark asked about that, that channel shift, uh, just to look at the police first on this, is there any connection or correlation between a reduction in call handlers as a result of increased um, access digitally? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, what we're actually seeing is more calls. So no, we're definitely not reducing call handlers. Okay, that's what, so what you get in some uh, organisations is they, yeah. they do a channel no. shift and then they reduce Ab the actual... Ab okay. Absolutely not. No, it's actually around us being able to, to deal with demand, I think is probably how I'd, I'd describe it from an internal perspective. Yeah. As I say, lots, lots of uh, advantages to the, to the public, but for us internally, it's actually about being able to manage demand better um, but no, we have the exact uh, okay, call handlers. So. We we need as many as we can can get. To be honest. Yes, absolutely. All right. So we're moving to the the final section, and I'm aware of the time pressure the police are under. So perhaps any to come in on on the sure. back Sorry, of I missed um, that on my notes. Uh, apologies, Member Russell. Uh, yes, just very briefly. It's just picking up on the point about accessibility. Now, Darren, you mentioned just earlier about screen reading technology, but from the perspective of staff using the technology that's all being rolled out and I'm just wondering what checks you're doing on the accessibility of the digital channels that are meant for Londoners who are accessing your services. Uh, 
uh, yeah, we absolutely make sure that our online service, which I say is a shared one across policing, but it's one that, that the Met has developed and hosts the technology for, is, is compliant with all the appropriate national standards. So, yes. Thank you. Apologies there, Assembly Member. Um, so we're moving to budget and efficiencies, and we're going to start with Assembly Member Harani. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, before I actually go into the budget, actually, there's a quick follow-up with, with Darren, given uh, the answer that you gave on the back of uh, Assembly Member Clark's question around um, equipment and uh, the, the sharing across uh, different government departments as well. Do you have any sort of estimates on how much you save per item or license based on sort of bulk buying and that consumer spend power that you mentioned before or is that information you can get to the committee afterwards i think it will be very variable to be honest it, it would be deal to deal it's sometimes hard to know what deal you would have got without the volume um certainly there are published information for example on microsoft licensing where the g government does receive a significant dis discount on the on the commercial price and, and we benefit from that licensing deal. So that would be a, probably the best single example I could give. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna try and guess the percentage in this forum, but I, I, I know the Cabinet Office will publish that information okay. on, or Crown Commercial Services will publish the, that discount rate. It is significant. Thank you, thank you, that's fair enough. Um, so just on, on budget, um, and I'll start maybe with, with you, Darren, um, since you have the mic already, but uh, what is the budget for delivering your digital strategy this year and across the life of the whole strategy? Uh, how have you allocated the budget across the different priorities that you have and what would you say is the biggest source of your expenditure? Yeah, let me, let me, um, we'll find some more details. So the, let, me, the, let me check the, the broad uh, spend for the year in 22-23 will be 224 million uh, is our expenditure. Uh, of that, about 60% of that, the majority, is based just running our service, uh, you know, keeping it operational. That could be everything for what we call Pegasus, which is basically our, the management of our applications and infrastructure. Uh, which is a, a large deal we've done with two organizations, Cap Gemini and Atos, uh, which is, you know, and we're delivering that. That itself will yield about a 20 million saving per year. Uh, so it's an important thing how we manage that with partnerships to do a good job. We have another 47 million with third party contracts, everything from print service to Oracle to Azure, a cloud service, and how we measure all those things. So they're third parties. Airwave is about 14 million give or take. We have a, a healthy spend in Microsoft. That's just not just 365, that's everything, servers and whole infrastructure, about 19 million. And then uh, command and control and BT legacy. So that's about 60% about, about of our budget. We then spend, the next significant part is with our he headquarter. Uh, that's about 25%, 50, 57 million. Of that, 27 million is national programs. Um, you know, like AMPR and other things. Uh, that's driven by the the, the, um, the funding formula. You know, we're about 23% and therefore um, that is a, you know, the number is what the number is. Uh, and so that's a healthy part of our budget. Uh, PEGS itself actually managing the project is about 16 million. And then we have about 6 million set aside for innovation uh, aspirations and goals. And then the rest is left with internal projects. And then running our organization, uh, deep digital policing, uh, is 15 million a year. So that's our current kind of profile. One thing worth bearing in mind, just looking back at the last few years, uh, effectively every year we kind of, we save money and we invest more money with growth. If you take away the national programs, over the last five years, actually it's flat. We've saved 60 and spent 80, but take away national, it's actually about flat. So that's not bad given growth and increasing demands. So every year we do have that challenge of always trying to save and invest accordingly. Mm -hmm. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, th thanks, John. So, uh, yeah, as, jo as John says, br broadly speaking, it, it would be flat, but we've got some additional national charges that, that, that come to us. Um, I think then so that, that's our running cost. That's what it costs to, to run the organisation. Um, we've then got investments in terms of uh, modernisation. So um, 
it's around, so for the same year that, that John's described, it's, it's 38 million in infrastructure upgrades and changes and refreshes. So this is our servers, our data centers, our various business applications uh, that we need to, to refresh and renew. Um, and then um, actually there's then replacement of the, the end user devices, because obviously they come end of life. You'll know from yourself from using your you know, laptops, tablets, et cetera, you know, as, as the batteries start to degrade, you then need to ultimately replace them. Um, and that, that is a rolling program now because we've now made that commitment to our officers uh, to make sure that they're, they're a mobile workforce. We then have to constantly refresh that and that's over a, approximately a three year life cycle. So that's around 15 million a year on a, on a three year rolling program. Just to, just to probe a bit on the national charges. So what if uh, for any reason you are unable to meet those? Have you ever faced a scenario where you are unable to meet those? And what would what's the opportunity cost, if you like, of, um, of meeting them? Because that would mean that the other charges that you have that are non-national ultimately have to give way. Um, it, it is a challenge. Uh, we, we don't have an option, to be honest, fr frankly. So we can't do without access to the police national computer or the police national database or the national ampr so we are recharged with them and effectively it's kind of one of the first bills we almost have no choice but to pay um before we then obviously then get into what's more, more within our control uh, although as john's described a lot of the money we spend effectively is, is committed at the start of the year because we have you know, a number of systems and solutions that we just have so, to run so where's that money going so, so it's going centrally to yeah to the home office to the Home Office. Yeah. So the Home Office is purchasing uh, licenses which it's recharging to local forces, um, is that? It's, it's not just licenses. So if you take the Police National Computer, for example, that's housed within a data center. It's got servers and software and people that support it and third-party contracts of suppliers that help support it. So they're running a, a service but which then effectively your, we're consuming. You, so you, but then your funding primarily comes from the Mayor and, uh, and, and the Home Office. So isn't it sort of inefficient to be circulating money around which is going back centrally anyway wouldn't it just be easier to for the home office to to, to have a system where locally um all the forces are are, are able to, to have what they need without having this recharge um i i i i, I take your point i mean i'm not an accountant so i can't comment on the the accounting treatment etc i think though I, I would be coming here without giving you the probably the, the full extent of what it costs to to run the METS IT though, because we do consume that technology to enable us to deliver our services. So I think that's probably the flip side of an argument I'm probably not qualified to have, but as, as I say, I think that, that's why it's a recharge, because then we, we can show actually the full cost of, of delivering the technology that our officers and staff and, and the public rely on. So I think that's probably the counter argument to, to effectively a, almost a top slice, I think is probably what, what you're describing. Okay. I think certainly, I think when um, something to look into um, for for the chair and maybe uh, the subsequent uh, committees, if uh, if there's anyone from PCC here as well, maybe. Uh, Julian? You see, I don't have detailed budget information, uh, but I can make it available uh, after after the meeting, uh, if, if, that's, if that's required. I think um, going forward, I recognised a lot of what Darren was saying. So we've got payments to Microsoft, Airwave, Capita, who are our supplier of our um, current, current mobilising system. Um, and my revenue budget for, for next year, for example, is about 20 and a half million. Uh, most of that is um, committed spend, it's keeping the lights on money. And in parallel with that, to support our work programme, which in turn is supporting the Transformation Initiative and CRMP, there will be a significant capital investment programme. Um, again, I don't have those details with me, but um, I, I can make sure the finance people can provide those. Um, but I think a lot of similarity in terms of uh, the Microsoft piece, for example. And if I could just loop back on that, it's interesting because um, some of this collaboration in terms of reducing uh, Microsoft licenses could be done more at a national level. So, for example, I'm not able to access the police um, deal. It's a separate fire deal. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think I'm correct in saying that the police get a better deal than the fire service do. So I think, effectively, if there was more centralised um, commitment and negotiation to a, a commonality of approach there, we, we would all benefit. Um, it's just it's slightly frustrating. It's probably a health one as well, I don't know. Um, it's almost a divide and conquer type thing um, yeah. can I just clarify on that so the, 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 there was a police Microsoft deal uh, a number of years ago and you, you're absolutely right Julian but um, we, we now no longer use that we now use the, the central cross-government deal so unfortunately no, we, ha we haven't got a better deal than you anymore mm. <laughs> All right, and from, from the LAS 
Uh, so I don't have um, detailed uh, budgets with me, but we, we have a capital, we have a BAU budget that uh, that, that we we would run uh, to uh, to, uh, to keep the lights on, which is around about 18 million, six million of that is in staff costs, 12 million in uh, in non-pay. Um, there is a capital allocation made to uh, to the organisation where we then have to compete with uh, the other big ticket items such as estates and fleets. Um, for, uh, for for our allocation this year, we will spend um, probably around about six million pounds on on completing uh, multi-year projects such as the uh, the control room, uh, CAD system, and uh, telephony systems. Um, there are opportunities for us to uh, to compete and bid um, against uh, NHS um, pots of money that I mentioned earlier on, Unified Tech Fund and uh, UTF as it's known, and Podac, uh, which is. Um, uh, a, a, a number of smaller parts of the NHS, so um, pharmacy, ophthalmy, uh, dentistry, ambulance, and community, um, that, uh, that that we also have uh, opportunities to uh, to bid for um, money. Um, generally, that's matched funding. So whatever we we obtain from there, then we have to match that in uh, in what we provide within the organisation. So so it is. It, it, we we've done quite well through uh, through, through that process. Um, and we have sufficient capital this year to, uh, to complete um, our, our work. Thank you. And what, what have been the main financial challenges in implementing your digital strategy? Uh, I'll start from, from the ambulance service. I, I think it's, um, it, 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 it's acceptance that, uh, that projects are multi-year. You know, they don't start uh, at the beginning of April and finish at the end of March. Uh, and so sometimes that, uh, that, that start-up process of, uh, of, of coming into another year um, where you don't necessarily know what capital allocation has been given to you. Um, so it's, it's difficult for, um, uh, for, for finance to uh, allocate money until they know what the, uh, the trust is going to get as a, as a whole. Um, so it is uh, really around continuity for, uh, for, for us, but, uh, but we, we've managed uh, reasonably well over the last couple of years to, uh, to, to overcome that. So that's a fair point, and it works the other way around as well, because we've already heard earlier on about um, how some of your digital strategies for, from across um, the, blue, the Blue Light services are brought forward in light of COVID as well. Julian, anything to add? Yes, certainly. I, I think um, uh, in terms of our digital strategy, the, the, the corresponding work programme will, will deliver a, a series of projects, and those projects may be business-led or maybe IT-led. Um, and if, for example, it's a business-led product, project, for example, replacement of command units, then that money will exist in a capital program, um, and I will write a report and draw upon it and take it through governance. If there's a, so the challenge for me is if there's a consequential impact of supporting that project in terms of revenue, then I'm going to have to write a growth case at the end of the year to go for the budget savings round to actually bid for that growth to add to the, to the revenue so I can keep the lights on budget, really. So the challenges really for me, uh, I suppose, are timing, uh, and also the creation of the governance reports to, to get the mayoral approval to take it forward. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think there are one or two areas uh, in terms of challenge. One is um, uh, it's more the use of risk-based financing. In terms of some programs we do, they kind of fall into two categories. They're either very straightforward, uh, we know what to do exactly, and therefore the cost will be quite precise, and we literally can measure that day by day. I think other projects, because we are trying to be quite innovative, it's less able to guarantee at the early stages. So we need a, a slightly different governance approach to how do you kind of deal with slightly more fluid investments. And working with MOPAC, trying to understand how we could do those two together. At the same time, you know, we're also trying to use more dynamic elastic services like cloud. So how do we actually just pay for things we use only? Uh, how do you put that into a budget plan? Because it's based on consumption, which is hard to sometimes forecast. So we're trying to, and we are working closely with MOPAC to just evolve our whole accounting process and the process for asking for budget and measuring the benefit case. Thank you very much. I mean, it's interesting that that sort of live forecasting on these issues is something that local authorities will deal with all the time in terms of sort of, you know, uh, child protection, things like that, and budgets around um, social care. Uh, so it can be done. It's, it's always tricky for a budget and performance committee to examine or ask questions about budget when we haven't got the figures. So I'd, I've, I've asked Gino to just to, to, to write to you to see if you can send us something, which I think colleagues around the table will probably appreciate, and they can maybe take to other committees that they also sit on, because those, those budget numbers give us an idea of, of performance. It's, it's the checks and balances. Um, 
So, so on that, and in terms of performance, a quick question from me is about underspends, any significant underspends or overspends. Are there anything in the delivery of the strategies you've got at the moment that are significantly underspent, significantly overspent, which would give us an indication that perhaps that performance isn't where you want it to be? I think I saw Julian indicate. I think in terms of the current year, certainly, because I've had a recent conversation about this, uh, the impact of some of the constraints on global supply chains is meant we can't buy stuff as quickly as we want. So that may run over the end of the financial year, certainly. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, that, that's an example of close, you know, budget monitoring that you yeah. c you can see that and how it impacts performance. Which you know, it's not saying that it's anyone's fault if it's a global supply issue. But Stuart, did I see you indicate as well? I'm nodding in complete support because uh, we've we, we've experienced the same challenge uh, in terms of the, um, the 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 availability of of items to be able to spend within year. Is that going across to the police as well? We concur. We <laughs> concur. So that's interesting, isn't it? There's, there's been um, a, an elastic, really, case here where the COVID came in and it brought everything forward in terms of strategy. Everything's come forward, and actually now that performance is being impacted because of global su supply chains. Is that correct? So does that mean the delivery of that strategy is going to sort of level out to original timelines? I think for us it's just seeing, um, I think it will level out, but certainly this year, yeah, I think that some of our partners have just um, gone a bit slower in fulfilling their services or their fulfillment. So it will level out, but they, I think they're all just facing uh, their own constraints. So they've just slightly underplayed where they need to be. But it will kind of recover and get back to probably a, a flat pl playing field in that respect. So thinking about some of the questions that we've heard from my colleagues on the committee, which is about that, that scrutiny, the governance function, is this is being highlighted somewhere on risk registers and in terms of monitoring, internal monitoring uh, data, yeah? And then as a result of that, sorry, that's a reciprocal question really, um, uh, how, what, what's the mitigation that's being put in place to, to manage that? So I, th I think uh, I would say this year of all years and more so, we've, we have a more concentrated view on our risk board, we're a very effective risk board. I think the, the mitigation is uh, just more attention to it and more monitoring of any deviations in a, in a slightly more real-time nature uh, than might have been previously the case. But no, I think our, uh, I think our risk conversations with like Darak are far more fruitful now because we really want to start understand the nature of the risk and how we should mitigate or monitor more effectively. Are those, are those risk registers something you'd be prepared to share with the committee as well? I think that, I that check. Would, I, might, I can't. I, I would just need to check. Yeah, I, suppose, I mean, but, you know, um, the, the, the two sets of data: what's the yeah. budget? How are we hitting the budget? And, and what are the concerns about delivery? They, they, certainly go, the through they go through Derek anyway, yeah. so I, I, I would imagine. But I that's great. Check. So I'll ask Gino to, to chase that up for us as well. Um, in terms of any um, sort of cost or time savings as a result of the digital transformation work, uh, what assessments have been done, and can you give us some examples of, of those efficiencies? I mean, I think it tends to be on a on a program or project by project basis. So obviously, you know, the strategy sets out our direction of travel and and the things we're trying to achieve, and then we then you know almost drop down to a, a program level. What what have we actually achieved? I mean, I mentioned earlier the kind of mobility, and the the, the extra time we believe officers are now in the field. Um, I talked about um, collecting um, you know CCTV from um, uh, bus garages, where where we looked at well you know how many times do we do that per per year. How many officers hours um, are therefore used doing that, and, and we've then actually confirmed we don't do that anymore. So that is a, it's it's an efficiency gain rather than a, I think a financial saving is probably the way I put it. I mean, obviously bear in mind that we are in the fortunate position where we're increasing our number of officers at the moment. So it would be very unlikely we'd actually make a financial saving because actually we're deliberately investing more in officers, but it's about ensuring that their time is more efficiently used. So we're not spending time rekeying data or coming back to police stations or you know going off to pick up yeah. you know multimedia that we can just deal with electronically okay so that'll be some examples and Barry I think I can see you in the case yeah I think that's exactly the same for, uh, for for the ambulance service it's trying to create more capacity trying to do more with 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 the same um, if you like I mean I, I, I probably uh, the best example we've got is that we're not creating 5,000 sheets of paper every day that, uh, that that we were in the past this uh, this all comes through EPCR um, which is, uh, is is real time data for us now as opposed to getting scanned a couple of weeks later so there are efficiencies that uh, that we're getting we are moving towards more of a paperless 
um, environment, certainly. So, so that will, will, will save us considerable time and effort. Um, but a lot of it is about reinvestment then back into frontline services. And I'd imagine a lot of those efficiencies were built into the strategy document. So that can be measured as a result of that. Sure. Yes, yeah, so, so it's uh, a, a part of the benefits realisation. So, you know, what, what, what I think we try to do with, uh, w w with um, a, a digital strategy is present opportunity and, uh, and, and let the organisation then determine um, what its operational clinical um, strategy um, actually is, uh, is going to be and to be able to, uh, to change that as, uh, as, as time goes on. So I think that what we're trying to do is, is facilitate that uh, for them. And uh, Julian, just to complete the set. Yeah, just to echo some of that, really, it's about, it's about introducing efficiencies to, to free up capacity so that people can work smarter, is a horrible term, but um, yeah. so, you know, to, to free up space because, as I'm sure you're aware, as an organisation, we are undergoing quite significant transformational change. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a massive programme of change coming down the line. So if we can actually give people the digital tools to work in a, in a more effective way uh, and, and become more productive, um, that's obviously going to help with that. How you measure that uh, financially, I, again, I, as I said earlier, I, I struggle personally to, to quantify it. But uh, it's in terms of the, the free up capacity and also uh, the point about the benefits realisation because from our perspective, sitting on a side of strategy, it's a series of projects or programmes and the benefits realisation I'd expect to be done at the project level rather than the, the strategy level. That's great, thank you. I'm, I'm aware of time, so what um, Gino's going to do is follow up, then we can get some of those budget figures, we can look at those risk registers, that will allow us, at the various police committee, fire committee, etc., to look at the two and, and, and see how the, how the budget is impacting on the performance that, uh, that we're seeing because of the digital transformation. To finish up, and I'm aware of time, uh, MPS, but uh, Assemblymember Russell has got two final... Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, in terms of these efficiency gains rather than savings do you have any uh, and you've kind of said how difficult it is to track so it may be that this question falls but I'll ask it anyway are there any processes that you have in place so that you can be sure that those efficiency gains are, are tracked um, to, who want does anyone want to John so yeah we, we, we do have a, a portfolio office a part of that that you know, with our transformation team is there to measure the benefit realization uh, and we do that really on the programs that we're doing uh, and again what I'd like to add on some of those programs some of them we've not only achieved the benefit first identified and crystallized we've also suddenly learned it can do a lot more than originally planned so we also capture that as well so that's very encouraging so that's how we track it but I think that's also an evolving picture because again how do you how do you put a value just certain aspects of efficiency or productivity. Uh, directly in IT, uh, we, you know, we, we directly save the cost of IT. Pegasus does that for us. But it, in policing, if we can handle more cases, you know, what value do you put to a case? If we mm -hmm. can get you know, more, you know, uh, reduce the level of rape, how, what value do you put against that? I would say high, but how do you, you know, crystallize it is, is always a, mm -hmm. a longer debate, I think. Does anyone else want to come in on that tracking of those efficiency uh, only, uh, Perhaps just a couple of points. W one is that, uh, that, that we do declare up front what we, we would expect by delivery of, uh, of project. There are benefits realisations where, where you know, it's important that, uh, that when you get a, a new system that you don't try to bend it to, uh, to look like the system that you've just taken out, otherwise you, you, you miss the point in some respects. So it is about what changes those opportunities present you, and, uh, and sometimes those aren't fully realised until the opportunity is, uh, is, is actually there. Um, increasingly, uh, my expectation is that, uh, that we would have to look within our own budgets to fund projects. In other words, we would have to justify the, uh, the revenue spend against those, those projects. So therefore, that, that would, your overall budget wouldn't increase in terms of delivering uh, a, a project as such, and therefore realizing that, uh, that, that, that benefit. Thank you. Is there anything from the fire? Just, just to echo the fact that as part of our transformation journey, uh, organizationally, not, not IT, uh, the, um, the, the transformation team have recently uh, set up a portfolio um, program office anyway. And certainly, um, things like this and the uh, business case is going to be far more scrutinised and the, the benefits realisation will crystallise as part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, 
Stuart and Barry, or Barry, I can't remember which of you, but I made a note of it earlier from the ambulance service, said that you aim to buy off-the-shelf software rather than going for in-house development, um, and you don't see yourselves as software developers. So in the context of that, um, my final question is about the digital expertise that your organisations have and um, and whether you use external consultants to deliver on your strategies so far. So should we start from the fire end this time? So certainly, we don't do any internal software development at all. We haven't done for, for many years, other than basic configuration. Um, it was a strategic decision that, that predated me. Uh, I have, I think it's the right one. Um, effect, effectively, um, we do use consultants or contractors, uh, terminology varies. Um, invariably, they'll be for, to come and deliver a specific high skill a piece of work um, that you can draw upon the expertise from the market. Obviously, you have to pay the market rates, but uh, to, to, to get your project up and running or, or as I say, leverage a particular expertise. Um, we do also use contractors quite a lot, and I, I do vary the terminology between the two. Um, I mentioned earlier the challenges we have with recruitment, and some of our posts remain vacant for quite some time. I have no choice but to fill them with contractors until we're, while we're trawling the market to get, get suitable candidates. Yeah. And when you're using contractors, presumably that's quite a high cost Per, that's a high day rate. It can be, yes, yeah, certainly, yes. Depends on the on the on the niche skill, yes, yeah. So would be would yes would make staying within budgets more challenging. It can be, it can be absolutely, absolutely, yes. But uh, you know, if if there's a, a project needs to be delivered by a certain time, and you can't, for whatever reason, get the skilled people you need to deliver it, then obviously you know you need to plan around that. And sometimes sometimes the cost is planned into the, into the, into projects. Sometimes it's picked up from underspends elsewhere. Um, you know, ideally, you wouldn't do it, but uh, if you can limit it to, to short-term, high-skilled um, candidates, then, then they, it can work to our mm -hmm. advantage, yeah. Okay, and so th the use of contractors and consultants, is, um, is that kind of a necessity because it's hard to attract people to get that in-house expertise, or is that a conscious choice that you'd actually prefer to work with contractors and consultants? It would depend on the project. Some, some projects are really, really high skilled uh, and you would, you, would, you would need a subject matter expert in, in, in that area to come in and uh, give you some, some advice. Um, mm -hmm. In other areas, uh, it's a necessity because you can't fill the role. Yeah, the, 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 the two coexist really, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Y yes, um, should we go for ambulance then police? <laughs> Okay, um, so, so we, we basically fund all of our, uh, or cost all of our projects based on um, uh, use of, uh, of, of a blend of contract uh, staff and BAU staff because transition is, is equally important. So where you move it from project status to, uh, to, to, to business as usual. Um, so we do try to, uh, to, to blend that workforce. You can't do it entirely with BAU staff, otherwise you wouldn't get any of your, your day work done. Uh, and, and equally, the, the, if, if you, if you did, did solely with, uh, with, with contract staff, um, then those transition uh, arrangements do become difficult. Um, normally for, for delivering a project, there, 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 there are certain, certain skill sets that you only need for about three or four months to get the project delivered. So there's no point in, in going out and recruiting that, uh, that, that level of, uh, of skill. So it is trying to find that, uh, that, that balance. We set costs of what we would expect to pay um, contractors based on, on uh, our experience and knowledge. Um, and then we, we try to, uh, to stay within those costs. So we, we, we've not been affected um, by uh, adverse costs on, on projects due to, uh, to contractors costing more than we expected. Thank you. And the police? So I think there's, there's two parts that on your buying off the shelf. I think that's a, a principle we have. I think in reality, though, sometimes it's not off the shelf as you think. So a lot of our projects, given our size and complexity, I call them first of a kind, as well as off the shelf, and therefore it's the first time that product's been used. So is that off the shelf, longer conversation. But that adds risk and cost potentially. Mm -hmm. As you bring it to your environment, all the inherent kind of legacy integration issues and data issues are, are a much bigger part of the cost of, a, of a buying a product. So, so yeah, that is a, uh, an opportunity and a challenge for us to do a good job. Therefore, in terms of people, we, yeah, we do rely on a, a fairly significant a contractor base, you know, but what we're also doing is looking at what are the core skills we wish to retain and make sure they are trying to be retained in-house versus other skills where having a temporary labor force is beneficial. 
it does give us flexibility so we can reduce costs quickly if we need to uh, and we get more flexibility from the contractor base as well but we get it we are very sensitive to the balancing of those two with the challenge of recruitment um, so we think it's okay but it, it is a people is always front and center of what we're doing at the moment thank you thank you chair Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank our guests for, for coming along this morning. We really appreciate you um, answering our questions. So, so thanks very much. You can feel free to, to go. We've got a bit of business to, to finish up. Uh, I mean, you're equally, you know, you can stay in the gallery and watch if you want, but I'll get outside whilst it's sunny. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Right. Can I ask the committee to note the reports and the discussion? Thank you. And can we also delegate authority to me as chairman in consultation with party group leaders, uh, members, to agree any output arising from the meetings? Thank you. Agenda item nine is the mayor's decision list. Uh, can I ask the committee to note the mayor's decision lists for the period 11th of March to 5th of May and decide whether to highlight any issues for detailed consideration? Noted. Uh, agenda item 10, can we note the committee's work programme for 22-23? Uh, which brings us to agenda item 11. The next meeting of the committee will be held on the 14th of July uh, 2022 at 10 a.m. in the Chamber City Hall. Um, I've no other urgent business for today, so that concludes today's meeting. Thank you, everyone.